want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really, really excited about this week's collaborative learning series on the topic of off-season team evaluation. And in these uncertain times, I know that this topic is very significant as we all have a lot of time to dive in and, and inspect our programs and, and how we can help and help improve them. And just looking at this screen, it's just amazing the people that, that we have with us. Um, a, a lot of different levels, a lot of very accomplished coaches that are way more accomplished than me. So thank you for, for everyone attending. Uh, before we get get into it, I just want to take a moment to express gratitude to all of our frontline workers and obviously the doctors and nurses and those working in healthcare facilities, but also all the other essential workers, you know, the people in the grocery stores, the mail and delivery services, and those in the food industry and, and a lot of other places. And I also think it's good to keep in mind the minority and underserved communities, which have been dis disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And as states are starting to open up again, let's just hope that we can take some good away from this time of reflection and, and solitude that we've, that we've had. Um, and really hopefully this just serves as a reminder of the importance of family and caring for one another and how interdependent we all are. Um, as always, I would just ask everyone, give me feedback after tonight. We're constantly trying to improve these sessions. So reach out to me individually and I would appreciate that. And I wanna give an explanation for the vision of Continuous Coaching Collaborative. We're on our, we are on our ninth week of having collaborative learning series Zoom calls. And I'm very proud of what we've all created. And it's really not about me, but it's, all, it's just about all of you guys and each playing a role in making this what it is. And it's a, it's a community and platform for coaches of all levels to keep furthering themselves as both people and coaches by sharing ideas and asking questions and thinking both critically and creatively. So thinking about this week's topic, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to look back and evaluate your team from, from last season or last few seasons. And I hope that we all gain new ideas that we can incorporate or even tweak to fit into our off-season evaluation process. Just one idea I have for everyone is to get outside of basketball. You know, all of you college coaches on here, you have so many resources at your disposal. And I know, you know, we'll see if there's students and uh, on campus in the fall and if there's sports initially, but I would just advise you guys to go sit in another coaches, coaches, uh, another sports coaches meeting or attend a fall training camp. You know, I think we all know that football coaches are probably the most prepared and organized and, and planning for different scenarios. Um, and us NBA folks, you know, we all have NBA teams, uh, NFL teams close to us. So go meet with them, observe, and I think we'll be able to get some perspective just outside of basketball. So that's all I have. Let, let's, keep our, let's keep ourselves on mute. If you're not talking, there was a little feedback earlier and I think we'll have some people trickle in. So that will help just all of this run smoothly. And any questions before we get going here? Great, so Mike Longobardi is with us tonight. I met Longo uh, two summers ago when we were both working the Nike Elite Camp out in LA, LA, and luckily for me, we were at the same station, and he's always been very gracious with me and has given me great advice. One of the best things he ever said to me was be high work and low maintenance, and I think about that saying almost every day. And you guys will see Longo's very good at what he does, but he doesn't rest on his laurels, and he's just a worker. So I just respect the way that he goes about his business. So thanks for being here with us tonight, Longo, and uh, take it away. All right, guys. Thanks, Jonah. Really appreciate you having me on. Obviously, you know, like this is a tough time, but it gives us a time to continue to grow and get better as coaches. My purpose tonight is, is off-season evaluation. And hopefully I can give you something maybe that you have done or haven't done to, to just stimulate you a little bit. Um, basically, for most of you guys, um, other than I see Luke, and I'm not sure if we have another NBA guy on here. You know, our season has basically been over, but we're getting ready to go back. But for you guys, most of your season is over, and, and there is no coming back for this year. 
So one thing that I did, and, th and I'm going to speak on my behalf, but, but please, this is going to help me just as much as hopefully it's going to help you. Anything that you feel that could be beneficial for us, we're always open to new ideas and things that will help us. I mean, listen, basketball, I heard a great line. It's not a, a, a science, it's an art. Like, you know, like, oh, excuse me, it's not an art, it's a science. You know, it just, just there's so many different ways to do things and so many different ways to play and ways to manage your team and get better. And there's no correct way. And I think the number one thing is to know your team. I think that's way more important than anything else. And I try to take like a big responsibility doing that, especially when the season's over. So I'll give you a little bit of a heads up because most of you guys know we're on a hiatus right now. So we've been gone for about two months. And, and I know Clay is on and Clay is a great resource if you guys want to talk about the NBA and now he's back in college. The NBA is like definitely a grind. You know, you have 82 games, you're playing probably every other day sometimes for like a four week stretch. Uh, to get two days off in a row is like a big bonus. But I know you guys have very difficult jobs because you're nonstop. Like you guys are 365. Like with us, when our season's over, you know, we can decompress a little bit more than you can. I know you college coaches, you're constantly worried about recruiting. And, and the way things are going now with transfers, you're even worried about keeping your own players. So if you can find time to take time to evaluate, um, I think it's a great exercise to do. Uh, the one thing I, took, I take a lot of pride in is keeping an excellent library. Uh, every year I do a, a video project and, and I'll elaborate more on that, but, but I feel like, for example, when whoever gets named coach, Taylor Jenkins gets named coach in Memphis, you know, I have a strong library of where he's been prior to, so that when we get ready to go into the season, I know what he's potentially going to work, uh, probably run and do both offensively and defensively. So anytime you can keep a good library, I think it's very helpful. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff is going to be geared towards, towards what I do, but like I said, hopefully it'll it'll stimulate you to think a little bit. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and go over this little presentation. And, uh, and I got some video at the end. And once again, just unmute, ask a question. Uh, we'll stop and take them and then we can elaborate from there. All right, so, okay, hold on one second. Jonah? Yep. I'm hitting share screen and nothing's, nothing's going. Oh, then I think the okay. Okay. Host share. disabled attendance uh, screen sharing. I'm gonna make you the host and then you can do it, okay? All right, go ahead. All right, here we go. Uh, all right, can you guys all see that? Yep. Okay, let me just make it bigger. Hold on one second. All right, so it's full screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, guys. So off-season evaluation, and like we just talked about, so, and I talked about the grind of the season, and now what's kind of an off-season. So, like, like I said, every year in the summer or when the season ends, you know, what's your plan of attack? So for me, the first thing I do is I, I just self-evaluate. I, I take some, excuse me, I take some time to, to rest. I take some time to recover and I take some time to reflect. Hold on one second. 
Uh, all right, I think we're good. Okay, just rest, recover, reflect. And then the next thing I'll do is I'll go into evaluating our team and then I'll go into evaluating each player on our team. Uh, I've been fortunate. I've been around a lot of good organizations and it's a whole collective effort. Now, I know some of you may have limited staff and resources, but the one thing that I've been fortunate to have is a great group around me. Uh, this past year in Washington has been amazing. Uh, this was my first year there. Just being around our player development staff with David Atkins and, and our coaching staff, Scott Brooks, Tony Brown, Robert Pack, and the rest of our coaches, and then our front office with Tommy Shepard and his staff. Like we're all in this together, and I know everybody preaches that, but I really feel like what we're doing in, in Washington, you know, we're heading in a good direction. Obviously, we're gonna get John back, but now we're what we're gonna look to do is how can we get better even having John back? So part of the, the evaluation is we'll look at our team and then we'll go into each player. So going back to like evaluating ourselves, right? So the first thing I always ask is, you know, was I the best assistant I could be? And I know Jonah had mentioned this. When I first got my break in the NBA working for Jeff Van Gundy, his big mantra was as an assistant, you have to be high work and low maintenance. You know, you can't be one that's, whether it's a pain in the ass, asking for extra gear or asking to leave early, you just put your head down and you do your job. It's pretty self-explanatory. But I thought that was the best piece of advice someone gave me as I came into the NBA. How, how can I just be really effective just being high work and low maintenance? And, and I'll be honest with you, like the one thing that's interesting, so I was in Houston, my first job, Garrison Rosas is now a general manager of the, the Minnesota Timberwolves. You know, I was in uh, Boston and Ryan McDonough, who was like in the front office, he became the GM of the Phoenix Suns. And now like in Cleveland, uh, we have uh, Trent Redding. He's gone on to be with Lawrence Frank as assistant GM. And then you just never know like who you're going to be aligned with or who you're working with that is gonna be that next person. I know we hear that all the time, but it is so, so true. Um, the next thing I just try to look at was, was I effective and efficient with my time? I thought Coach Brooks had this great saying, every day we had practice, particularly when we started, was to win the day. You know, I, I like slogans and mantras and all that, but, but this one really stood out to me because it's simple. Like, I think sometimes we all try to be super, like, like sophisticated, and I get all that, but you gotta understand in the, in the field that I'm in and the players I'm dealing with, that stuff is great, but it can, it can definitely wear off. I think the biggest thing for the players at our level is like, do you know what you're doing? And are you prepared? And are you genuine? Because yeah, you can come up with slogans and you can come up with you know, 15 bullet points, but at the end of the day, they wanna know if you know what you're doing. And I, I think that's critical. And that's why the next thing for me is the only thing that I care about. Was I genuine and was I prepared? Like the bottom line is these guys that I'm dealing with and, and I can't trick anybody. I have to come every day to work on as a coach, especially with my responsibilities. Maybe, you know, if you're a lower level assistant, you could get away with it. But these guys are constantly asking me questions every day of like, what are we doing today? What's our coverages tonight? What are our adjustments? What do we have to expect? And if I'm not bam, 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 back at them, then my credibility is gonna be really, really tarnished. So I take a lot of pride in that. And I just think at the end of the day, I had a situation happen to me this year. Uh, we had a player like, you know, come up to me and talk about playing time. And he said, coach, you know, I wanna play. And then you lay it out and you say, okay, have you done this, this, and this? And then, you know, he says, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. And then I say to him, well, listen, I'm going to be honest with you right now. I want to be a head coach. Just like you want to play, I want to be a head coach. But we have to be patient and wait our turn. So the bottom line is, my message was, to him was, when your time comes, make sure you're prepared 
And when you do get in the game, you have to nail it. You have to make it so difficult that the coach has no choice but to keep you and leave you in the game. So that's like kind of where I am on a self-evaluation standpoint. There are probably other things I could think about. And if anybody has anything they want to add that they think about when their season's over, just to themselves personally, feel free to chime in and un unmute your, your uh, computer. All right, we got a quiet crew tonight. Hold on one second. Okay. All right, so the next thing that I do after, like I sit home, because I, I, I take a lot of time to rest. Um, when our season's over, and this year when we found out this pandemic was going to be, was going to be extended, I kind of did go into like a shutdown mode where, you know, just thinking, not really watching basketball, um, but just like doing this self-evaluation. Um, it's interesting, like Bill Russell, I think, has said this. Like when your season's over, if you're not exhausted, then did you actually give everything that you had? And, and I know for coaches and for myself, I get mentally exhausted. Uh, particularly these last two years have been really challenging for me as, as, a, as a coach. And, and maybe this is something you guys may be going through. We had uh, so many different injuries and, and injuries over an extended period of time where we were rotating guys in and out. I think we tied a record for sure for number of players playing in a game, at least one game. It was like close to 29. Um, like our roster got that big. And we were filling in guys from the G League. Uh, we brought actually a player from overseas. And our balance to our roster was like really, really in flux. And that's like takes a toll on you because you got to constantly change your game plan. You got to constantly be ready for different types of matchups. How are you going to put your guys in the best uh, position to succeed? So, you know, after like, like taking that time to rest, recover and evaluate, then I just start looking at our team because we didn't know when we were coming back and hopefully we're going to come back soon. But really for teams like for us and others, you know, our season's basically going to be maybe five or six more games. So the body of work is already in. So now I just really started going over uh, our rankings with our analytics department. Now, I'm not sure what kind of analytics you have at your level, but I know there's always something that you could do to be creative, to study who's the best, you know, field goal percentage, uh, points per possession team, defensively, offensively who's the best offensive rebounding percentage team, defensive rebounding percentage team. You can study all those trends and see where you, where you stack up. Cause I do think it is good and it's a benchmark you can give your guys. And, and that's something that I feel like they'll look at and understand. And, but the biggest thing for me analytically is, is the lineups. Um, like I learned this from doc rivers, the basketball game right now is a game of chicken. It, it's changed so much where it used to be two bigs all the time and where now it's like solely one big and now even becoming no bigs on the floor. And, and his thing always was in the game of chicken, you know, if you're going to play big and they're going to play small, who's going to budge? Are you going to overpower them so much that they're going to have to sub in and come back big? Or are they going to out quick you, out finesse you, out skill you that you're going to have to sub small? So I'm always interested to see uh, where we stack as a small lineup and, and versus a big lineup or vice versa, a big lineup versus a small lineup. This year, we really didn't play much big lineup. I think there might've been like eight minutes total. Uh, we just really played more with a, with a smaller four, but, but our four that we played with, and some of you might know uh, Rui Hachimura because he just came from college last year. You know, he still has to learn to expand his game, which he's doing. But we don't have like a, a stretch four or a stretch five, per se, with another power four. But I'm always interested to see that. And then, like, just the day-to-day -day operations. Um, we, we, to me, there's three days in the NBA uh, because, because this is really like you never know what day it is. 
Sometimes you don't even know what city you're in. Sometimes you don't even know what hotel floor you're on because you go on the road, on the road, on the road. Um, but to me, there's three days in the NBA. It's a game day, it's a practice day, and it's an off day. So when I evaluate how the season went, one thing that we did differently in Washington this year was we did not do shoot arounds on game days at home. We basically just had a meeting two hours before the game. We have a facility that has a basketball court in it at the arena. We would show a personnel edit for about five to seven minutes before, and then we'd walk through our five plays that our opponent is going to run versus just doing a straight shoot around, which we did do when we were on the road. It was just the home games. And in and, and evaluating it and Coach Brooks' decision was, we have a lot of guys in a, in a heavy traffic city like Washington and, and New York, L.A., Chicago, I'm sure are tough cities. And Boston also is another tough city where it kind of makes some sense because now your guys have to get up if you do decide to have shoot around, drive, then drive again, then drive back, drive back again. We're here, they're just making one trip. So it keeps them off their legs. It keeps them out of traffic, especially if you're gonna have shoot around at a normal shoot around time, which is usually around between 10 and 11 o'clock. So I thought it was actually good for our team. I thought it kept us fresh. Um, I, I do think what we did do helped where we had a lot of younger guys and still made them come in only, like a handful of them, about five or six. They would come in, we'd script offense. I would go over the five plays with them. Then they would get shots up and they would get out and they would do it again. And the reason why I like that is for the younger players, they're learning. They got an extra rep going through a walkthrough, which I thought was helpful and beneficial. But for a guy like Brad Beal, uh, you know, who's been in the league going on his eighth year now. And I mean, he's been through the ringer. He knows shoot arounds and, and what team's tendencies are that I, I really believe that was a smart decision on coach's part. Um, the next day is, is a practice day. And then just evaluating like our, our workload, our load management per se, like that's the big thing right now in the NBA. You know, how did we manage our days? Did we go high when we probably should have went medium? Did we go medium when we should have went low? Uh, did we go low and should have had a day off? And those are some of the things that, that we really, you know, that I really look into because you know, a low day, which could be no contact and just come in and get shots, you know, did the guys need to be off their feet? If we played seven games in 14 days every other day for two weeks and on that 15th day, is it better for them to just not do anything? And th those are the questions you're always constantly asking yourself. On a medium day, should, should we have not like had them run up and down with their legs? Because it was you know, once again, the seventh game in 14 days, it's day 15. Should we have just gone low contact or no contact at all? And then the high days, especially for us, you know, you very rarely get a high day once the season starts. But I would more look at it like, you know, you guys play maybe twice a week. So one of those days, you're going to have three days in between games, probably, right? Depending on your schedule. So is, is that day off after a game, should that be a high day or should it be the next day after that? Those are the questions, you, you know, as you self evaluate in the off season that you should think about. Um, I think, you know, there's so many people, there's so many resources, everybody's trying to cover themselves. You know, we have monitors on top of monitors and chips and it links to the computer and they tell everybody's load and how fast they run, how many cuts. And I don't know if you have that, so you're probably going more off a of feel. But, but I do think it's, once again, evaluating your feel for the team. And these things, can you, you know, can you take into consideration maybe what you should or should not do? And then on an off day, like for me, it's recovery for the players. And it's a big day for me to get ahead with my preparation. And like, I don't, uh, I don't live with my family. Uh, my family stayed back in Cleveland and I have an apartment in Washington. So on off days, 
uh, because I have the place to myself with no distractions and I don't have any player development responsibilities. Um, I'll just stay home, may sleep a little bit later, and then I'll just work the whole day from the house without interruption. Uh, but then if, there's a, if it's an off day and I need to come in, then obviously I, I come in. Coach Brooks is tremendous with, you know, just get your work done. You know, he doesn't micromanage. Um, and I, this is something that might be interesting for you college guys, because I know like, you know, you guys are constantly paranoid of, of everybody working. And, and if I don't come in, then am I losing an edge? I mean, that's up to you. And that's something to self-evaluate. To me, with, with the video access, with downloading and sending via Dropbox or however you do it, we transfer. And if you have a setup where you're in a zone and you can get going and get moving um, without any distractions, because sometimes I feel like when I go into the office, it can be more distracting than beneficial. You know, for you, maybe it's an athletic director or another coach coming in and you're trying to get work done. Like for me, it's the same thing. Somebody could pop in where I could just stay home and get, get you know, an extra hour or so of uninterrupted work where I can really focus and lock in so I can be efficient with my job. So those are some of the things from a team perspective that, that we look at um, that are really, really helpful. Uh, once again, let's open it up. If you guys have anything that, that we may go over that you would be interested in, feel free to ask and I, I'll be more than happy to answer the best that I can. Hey coach, if what, so if you got dropped off, let's say you got a head job at the collegiate level, mm -hmm. what would your opinion be of load management? Like what would that look like for you at the collegiate level? Like would you be a believer in it or not? like balancing that with like truly getting enough reps to develop players and whatnot, because the kids aren't going to be as good at the collegiate level, no matter what level they're at. That's a great question. I know this, I would definitely play as much as I could, uh, but maybe for the amount of time that I would play, I would limit, limit it, excuse me, or maybe in terms of like having reps, maybe go, we do a down, we do a half court, down, back, down. You know, we do a se uh, several segments of that because in speaking with our performance people, that's how they feel you get into shape. It's not so much just running sprints, sprints, sprints. It's the start, stop, start, stop, start, stop versus just like, okay, let's just run them to death. And that's not going to help. That's going to really enhance injuries according to them. So I would definitely do that. Now, depending on the time of the season, you know, obviously earlier in the year, more, but we had a rule with, with Houston, and I really liked it. We never went more than four days in a row. So if we had a game, like day off practice, game, uh, day off practice, uh, we, may, we, may, we may just have like a meeting before the game so they get to sleep in that day. Or we may give them off that third day after and then just come in and have a shoot around. So I think it's all your team. My biggest concern is like, why do people get hurt? All right, number one, in my opinion, uh, um, my opinion is like, they're not physically ready, right? So I would be really, really leery of your younger players. You're like, you don't want to throw the wolves in the den, right? Like you got to really, really be careful. Like, it's interesting. I'm watching some of these college guys for the draft and I haven't watched them all and I haven't watched all the top prospects, but the prospects I've watched are definitely talented. You know, there's no question about it, but I just feel like physically they're really going to have to, I'm, I'm concerned. Like if we just throw them in an NBA practice with in the, this year with this COVID pandemic, we're going to get cut short for next year. So now we're going to throw guys out there who haven't been through a summer league or coaching practices and then expect them to go out and play. And that's where our performance staff check, uh, uh, steps in. But getting back to your point, you're, I don't know how many people you have to answer to. What do your trainers say? How do your players feel? But I would definitely go more. I would go more high, but definitely shorter spurts. And then – I would definitely do when they need a day off, you know, I would say I'd be leery of giving it to them because your guys are younger. 
So I would do more, let's make it more mental, okay? Let's walk through our sets. Let's walk you through our sets. I'm sorry? Oh, that was some interference. That wasn't me, yeah. Okay, I'm saying walk through your sets, walk through your, um, your coverages. Maybe you know you have an opponent coming up, whether it's Colby College or Amherst, and you know they run something that's really difficult to defend, and you may not be playing them for like maybe three weeks, maybe right there. Not that you want to tell them you're looking too far ahead, but maybe you just go over that from a mental perspective. So physically they're not exhausted, but mentally they're actually using their, their brain and stuff. And, and, and they're now getting knowledge for, for what your game plan is going to be when you play those games. Thanks coach. You got it. Hey, Mike, in my understanding what, what you're saying, are you, you're involved in all 82 preps? Well, you know what, this year, uh, was the first year that I stopped doing all 82. Uh, when I was in Boston, when, when uh, Lawrence Frank left and I took over. So for two years in Boston, I did all 82. And then my two and a half in Cleveland, I did all of them. And then when I was in Cleveland, when I, when I, when I went to Cleveland for that three and a half, I did all of them. So this was the first year I was a little bit back crazy because I didn't have every game. So I actually had a little bit of time to breathe. Um, but, but that's where I get back to like my off day. So especially when I was in Cleveland, cause I live about 40 minutes away from the facility, 35, 40 minutes away. So if it was an off day, my kids were in school instead of wasting over an hour and 20 minutes driving, I use that hour and 20 minutes to just work from home and, and, and get ahead of the game, you know? Um, but DC, it's a little bit closer, but I have a nice confined space in my apartment. Right. So, yeah, I, you know, jo Jonah can speak to it because when you, when you have Jonah's job, you're involved in all 82 and, and like to put that in perspective and Adam Cohen, I know you're on the, you're on the call. Um, I had 12 this last year in a 30 game season. Mm -hmm. And it, you put that in perspective, it would take, it would take seven years to have one season in the NBA when you're doing all 82. So, uh, you know, that's a phenomenal it's a phenomenal chore on your part, yeah. but I'm suspecting uh, that, you, you know, you're, you basically have more than one doctorate in NBA sets and coverages and all that kind of stuff that goes along with it. Having, you know, having been, that's part of your responsibility and what you learn along the way is incredible. Yeah. I will say this though. I really believe this. I think the big thing for me is, is just keeping a good library. Like, like, Look, we're not building a bomb, right? Like we're, we're uh, you know, we're coaching basketball. And I'm sure at your level, uh, it's the same. Um, how many people run the same stuff, right? How many people are running, whether it's screen to screen or double drag, stagger away. And I'm not saying everybody does it, but like that's where I feel the biggest challenge to my job from a preparation standpoint is is I got to pick the five things that I know are going to be most important for tonight's game. Hey, I may skip double drag tonight because we covered that the last three games. I feel like we got a good pulse on that. And then it could come back to bite me in the butt, you know. But those are the decisions that when I go into the game, I always feel like are the toughest ones. If you guys hold on one second, I just want to turn this light in the office on. Excuse me. You know, what's interesting, Mike, is that I, I found at the collegiate level, I, I found myself trying to associate what guys were running with my NBA background, like, okay, this is wedge or this is you know, like, what, you know, whatever it is. But at, at the collegiate level, and maybe it was just our opponents or whatever, it's, my, it's been my first year back in a long time. But there's a lot of teams that run, frankly, a bunch of bullshit. Um, to wind the clock down. Like they're not really, they don't run stuff initially to get to what they're really going to ultimately get to. So you have to sift through 20 seconds of stuff and say, okay, what are they trying to do here? Uh, and it took me about four or five games to realize they're not trying to get anything out of this. Uh, they're just trying to get the shot clock down because uh, <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want to play that many possessions. And, and so I, I found myself saying, okay, this is, this is that, this is whatever. Um, but I, maybe some of you college guys can, can, uh, that maybe have had some pro experience. Like I was, I was 
stunned at the beginning of the season. Like, oh, I'm not sure what these guys are trying to get out of this. Like, I could tell what they were running, but I couldn't tell what they were trying to get out of it. And yeah. It took me about a, it took me several games to go, oh, they're not really trying to get anything out of it. You know, it's interesting because I've been watching some of these college games, and, and I, that's the first thing I noticed. But then I did watch uh, Auburn and Bruce Pearl, and I felt like they got up and down, and I thought they – not to say they played NBA basketball, but they definitely took a high-level amount of threes. They definitely shot quick. They shot with no hesitation. And uh, it was actually a little bit pleasing to watch because – like, that's my biggest problem, and it's hard for me to watch a college game, and I don't want to say this disrespectfully, uh, because it's, like, exactly what Clay said. Like, in the NBA, you come down, you know, you may have a couple wrinkles here and there, but you get into your meat and potatoes, whether it's a pick and roll or whether it's an isolation or a post-up for the team's best player, you know. Um, but that, no, I mean, it's tough. And, and just knowing what's fluff and what's not, I mean, I feel bad that it took four games for you to figure that out. But now you know going into next year. Well, I'm, I, I'm not nearly as smart as you, Mike. It took me – it might have taken me eight, actually. I might have fudged on that. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, hey, Coach, one question on your preparation. Um, this is something we've talked about a lot as a staff, and I think the NBA is moving more this way. But, like, I mean, it, it's ironic because, like, I'm standing up the whole game shouting out play calls and, like, what's going to happen. But we really want our players to be able to react and – and know how to guard. You know, we talked about it the last few weeks in different ways, but we want them reacting, not thinking. And mm -hmm. so, like, I guess my question is, how much is it, like, about you guys versus, like, the opponent? And I know you're going to have your special player defense and maybe one or two sets, but, like, no, these two guys are guarding wedge or horns. Like, we always do this. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I do think you want to have your base, right? Everybody has a base package going in defensively, schematically. I think that's critical. But I know at the NBA level, I can't cover pick and roll the same way versus Kevin Love as I can with Julius Randle. I mean, they're two different skill sets. Uh, if I decide that I'm going to down every pick and roll or ice every pick and roll with Kevin Love, we're going to be vulnerable to give a, a three-point shooter unless we go into full rotation or we, we do a peel switch. And, and, but with Julius Randle, if he pops back and doesn't roll, we will, we'll be good with that and live with those results. And that's where the analytics comes into play and, and just playing the percentages. But I do agree with you. you got to have a base defense. And then you just got to hope, like, if a team – I don't know, you guys are, are, are in college – you know, the one thing I, that really drives me insane and it's tough for me to, to sit and watch is when a team runs the same thing over and over again and you don't get a stop. I mean, it would be interesting to see at the college level because in the NBA, they have the milk the cow philosophy. Like if something works, they're going to run it again. They're going to run it again and again to the, to you stop it. So what you would hope for is that, you know, Van Gundy's great saying about adjustments, right? Are you doing it as hard as you possibly can? So like the coverage that you're, you're asking for, are you doing it as hard as you possibly can? If not, don't change the coverage. Maybe let's change the player and the matchup. And then if that person's doing it as hard as he possibly can, then we got to change their coverage and make an adjustment. And hopefully your players will understand that and know like, oh no, man, we just gave up this. And then we gave up that. Man, we got to get a stop right now. Man, we have to make sure we, we execute our, our game plan coverage or our adjustment coverage, you know, much, much better. But most of the time, it's let's check our effort first. Are we doing it as best we can, as hard as we can, right? And then if not, that's not the case, then maybe we got to switch some matchups, right? We'll hide somebody going somewhere else. But usually once you do that in the NBA, the, the, the coach is going to find another matchup to pick on, you know, and then, and then it, you might have to just go ahead and change your coverages. Because I do, and, and once again, I'm sorry, Jonah, like you want your players just playing. You don't, Jerry Tarkani had a great line. I don't want my guys thinking. I want them just playing. You know, then it slows them down. I want them to play reckless abandon, free flowing. But there has to be a fine line of discipline too, right? You don't want to be reckless and, and, and put yourself in, in harm's way where now downhill attacks, 
Now you're helping kick out threes. Now the shot goes up, offensive rebounds. So there's a cause and effect to everything. Coach, I've got a question for you um, in regards to the, the shoot arounds. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess for me, and again, as a college coach, small college coach, assistant, you know, one of, one of the big frustrations for me, you know, as I look at our shoot arounds is like the inefficiency involved with it. Mm -hmm. And so we're on the floor for 30 minutes, maybe 45 tops. And again, we have a small roster size, probably comparable to yours in some ways where 12, 13, 14, 15, um, guys, but really the shoot around is 80, 85% of it involves five or six guys. Mm -hmm. And so the other guys, like they're just keeping them engaged throughout the course of the year. My question is more like, what are strategies that you've either implemented or maybe you've seen in different pro in different places that you've been? Um, I think coach Van Gundy had, I, I saw some, or maybe even Jonah had talked a little bit, some of the defensive stuff that they do as far as, the communication defensively, you know, you're not, you're not game speed with your reps, but you're game speed with your communication, but I'm just uh, on shoot around days. Yeah. I'm just curious if you can kind of elaborate or share uh, in regards to some of the strategy you've seen as far as the engagement piece, you know, kind of top to bottom with the roster from a shoot around standpoint. Well, I definitely agree. It's hard, right? Cause not everybody can be involved. Um, it, it's, it's a tough, tough dynamic. It's just the way it is. Right. One thing we do is, is we flip it. And, and what I mean by that is at least all 10 will go through the actions. So if we're going to cover double drag per se, the starters will be on defense first, the subs will run it, and then we'll flip it. And then we'll uh, have the, the subs go on defense and the starters will go on offense. So then at least if you do that, at least 10 of them are going to go over the plays so that, I don't know, if you dangle the carrot, if you got, when you guys come in, you know, and they run double drag, all right, let's get a rep for you as well. Um, and it keeps them kind of engaged. The problem sometimes is the other guys that are left over, right? And then one thing that drives me nuts is when coaches are cahooting with the guys that aren't playing, when they should be just like concentrating and it becomes a distraction to everybody else. To me, you just have to have that meeting right away to, to nip that in the bud uh, immediately. But if you do flip it, I think it gives them a chance to think, hey, well, maybe I will play. And when I do play, I'll get it, I will get a chance to, to, uh, to go over it. Now, this past season with our team, man, we had so many injuries that everybody got a rep. So I didn't really have to deal with worrying about getting those reps. The one thing you might want to do, because we do this with the guys, the ones that are not getting in the shoot around time. I don't know if you can bring them before, bring them after, or grab them to the side and, and just talk about the coverages so that when they're sitting on the bench, they know what the hell's going on. So that, hey, listen, you never know. Foul trouble, injuries, if they get thrown in the game, I, I don't know if you guys heard the story about Phil Jackson. I, who, who was it that ate a hot dog? Uh, uh, do you, John, do you know the story about Phil Jackson? I think it was on the Lakers. He saw a guy eating a hot dog before the game because he knew he wasn't going to play. And, and then he put him in the game. <laughs> like, he just threw him in there. Like, I, um, does anybody know who – Clay, do you know who that is? I mean, it's a story that's out there. Wasn't, out. wasn't that Cliff Livingston? I'm not sure. I thought it was somebody on the Lakers. It might, might have been Jordan Farmar is who it might have been. <laughs> Like he was eating a hot dog before the game, screwing around. That's still, it, coach. That was Farmer. That's, that's it. Right. So that's who yep, it was. It right? was him. It was so, him. Yep. So he was in the locker room, and Phil must have walked by and saw him screwing around, thinking he's not going to play. And then Phil threw him in the game, you know, because like you, who wants to be that guy, right? I mean, obviously the lesson was learned, like, but I just think it, it's very difficult. There's no that coach. I'm not trying to deflect the question. I do think. And I don't even know how big your staff is, right, to be able to do that. Or the other thing you could do is maybe not go over five plays, maybe go over three plays and have three groups and just constantly rotate them, you know, to keep them engaged. I don't think – I think like Jonah's talking about, we, we get off on knowing the play call and screaming out this, that, and the other. These guys can only retain so much that I do think 
that if less is more, but, but if the intensity is right, the communication is right. And I was fortunate to work for Jeff. I don't know how many guys have heard him speak, listen to him talk, and I'm biased. He's the best ever. Like when he's on the floor, his communication, his demand of the team, his one word commands, there's never any confusion. Like that's the one thing I always try to take pride in as I self-evaluate. I go out on the court. I don't have any, I don't have any notes. My notes are in my back pocket and I'm going like, okay, here we go. White group, double drag, 77 is the call. We're in two picks. When we come off two picks, if they go stagger away, we're in top lock. If they reject the top lock and pin down, we're shooting the gap. If they throw it back and go into a step up, if it's four or five, we're switching. Like that's how he is. That's how I learned from him. It was bam, 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 bam. And there's no confusion, right? That's why communication is so important, right? Builds trust, avoids confusion. If I know you're talking and you know what you're talking about, I'm going to have such a level of trust in you that I'm going to go out there and do whatever you ask me to do. So I kind of went a little bit all over the place, but maybe shorten it to three plays and you get all, all guys in. Or maybe with the second unit, you sub uh, three guys. So you have 13 guys, right? So three guys sub in with the second unit, you know, and you go from there. Now, one other thing that I did do, because this happens in our league, instead of flipping and going over the set, if I know the second unit is going to be in and say we're playing – the Clippers and Lou Williams is in the game and they run a certain play for him. I won't even have the starters go over that play, but I, I, I'm, I should take that back because he could still play in the fourth quarter, but I'll make sure we're going over that play because the second unit is going to have to cover it. If that makes any sense. All right. So ne next thing uh, we'll, we'll, I'll head to is uh hold on one second, let me just get this, is our player evaluations. So this is like really, really good. Um, uh, I can't really share with you the whole write-up that we have uh, because our guys have put so much work into it, our player development staff and our analytics people. But I'll give you a breakdown of how these evaluations were written up. So this is a player evaluation that we do we did for the off season. Like I said, we just had two months off. I basically just, and our, our staff basically try to get our summer projects done now. So the thing that's going to be interesting when our season is really over, it'll give us time to kind of do other great projects that we may want to do. But so what we did with our player evaluations is written up every player. The first part is an overview and it's stats. And depending on how long the player has been in the league, It'll go year by year with their, you know, progression, hopefully, or if they struggled, their degression, you know, highlighted. And, and for some players that may have played in the G League, they'll put their G League stats, excuse me, with their NBA stats. And then what they'll also do is do some comparisons. Um, I'm a little leery with the comparisons. I, I just don't like to compare because I feel everybody's situation is different. Uh, we may compare, you know, Bradley Beal to Ray Allen, but, you know, Ray Allen played with, you know, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and, and Rajon Rondo, where, you know, Bradley's only played with John as far as an all-star. So I feel like sometimes that's a little bit deceptive, um, and you have to be leery of that. But people like to do it, and, and if there is a good comparison in terms of they're trending in a positive direction, I think it can be beneficial. Uh, so that'll be the first part of the write-up, and there'll be some graphs and, and charts and, and professionally done. Um, and then the next part, we go into like an offensive write-up of what they did well and, and what they need improvement on. But we try to put some other stats in there that aren't basically box score stats. We, have a, we chart our shooting and practice through this device, NOAA. Uh, does anybody on this call have NOAA? I mean, besides, that's not NBA. Okay. This Noah thing, how many, do, are we all familiar with Noah or have you heard about it? I mean, it, it's amazing uh, what it can do. Uh, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Uh, so 
I was working, I won't name the team, and they had a, a staff member because it has facial recognition. So like when you walk in the gym, it sees your face and it can tell like as soon as you're shooting the shots. So this, this staff member was using the NOAA more than, I want to say 90% of the team. So, uh, so that we knew that that was a problem because if this guy's shooting more than our guys are, we, we got to get, we got to get our stuff together, but it's amazing. It, it, you come in the gym and, and you shoot and it keeps track of it. So I, if you don't have it, I don't know how you want to chart your shooting, but it's something that they can see like, okay, you're shooting 35% from three um, and you shoot 48% in practice, you know, Hey, listen, just keep, you know, keep your, your rhythm, your routine, you're eventually going to get to those percentages or vice versa. You know, you shoot 25% from three and you shoot 15% in practice. Hey, listen, we might not want to shoot those shots, you know, however you want to use it. But we try to go to like those stats, screening assist stats, hockey assist stats, just to let the guys know like there's more to it than just what comes up on the box score. Now, I know it's hard. And if your staff is limited with, re, you know, your resources, then just pick what's important to you and just make one of your guys do it. You know, the one good thing for you all is you don't have 82 games, right? Your season is much shorter than ours and you have a little bit of time in between. Uh, so I think it's definitely, you know, possible. Then we do a defensive write-up and then really try to, hone in on these stats, uh, our contests, our box out, and our charges taken. Uh, this year, we were number one in the league in taking charges. Uh, we did a really, really good job. We had 87 total. Second in the league was 62. Uh, Mo Wagner was amongst the league leaders, and then he took a significant injury and was out for an extended period of time. He would have definitely led the league, and Jonah knows him well being with him in L.A. But that's another thing that we take a lot of pride in, so if we can, you know, show those stats of where we ranked, where they ranked, hey, most taking all these charges, why can't you? Or why won't you sacrifice your body if Brad Beal, who's an all-star, is second in the team in taking charges? So those things in our written up evaluations for them. And then the last part is a summary. And, and this is like a booklet of 10 to 12 pages, great graphs, very organized. And in the summary part, the last part, is like how like what are we going to do all right most of the time i'm sure all of our players need to get stronger right the thing i'm really looking forward to seeing in a good way hopefully is our guys hopefully have gotten stronger over this two-month hiatus i know we're all coaches right we all battle with our strength coaches correct i mean we all love them but they complain that we work them too hard that they don't have time to uh to get the maximize, maximize their energy to just focus on strength and conditioning, right? We got practices, we got shoot arounds. And, and now for these two months, there's no excuses, right? They're not in the gym. They should be just basically working out, getting stronger and, and so that they can sustain a, a longer career. Um, and then the next thing is like their skill sets. How are we going to improve them through video, you know, studying the game, um, what kind of workouts are we going to have? Are they going to be beneficial? Like, like what do they need to work on? And you guys all know this stuff, right? If your guy needs to work on making corner threes, then have him shoot a lot of corner threes. If they need to work on, you know, uh, catch and go attacks and finishing at the rim, then incorporate that in their workout. You know, the one thing I would try to say, the, my only pet peeve I have, with player development is, is not enough emphasis on defense. And, and one thing I thought our staff did a good job of is we were tricking our guys a little bit with our player development incorporating defense. So we, I had them say, add some combo drills. So for example, come off a flare screen, shoot a corner three, and then simulate that you're guarding a dribble handoff immediately following. Uh, simulate that you're guarding a pick and roll, fighting to get back in front, and then shuffling back to relocate the space to shoot a three. Uh, simulate that you're going to trap the box on a baseline drive and then maybe flash cut, duck into the middle for a jump hook. So do some kind of combination stuff 
Because n- listen, none of these guys want to go and, and do closeouts in an open gym, right? They, they want to work on their game. But what they don't understand is defense is a big part of the game. So if you can trick them, get them to do multiple drills, I think that would be beneficial for your group. All right. And then any, any questions on that, uh, on this booklet? I can, I can steer you in the right direction. I just can't, like, print out a copy for you. I guess for copyright purposes, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, coach, uh, question for you just on, I, I know you can't be specific, but on the stats you're using, are you just using like kind of top line stats or, you know, with the, with the data we get in the NBA now, you can obviously go super deep and situational. Are you, especially when you're, when you're, and this is a leading question, but when you're going, uh, you know, player development stuff for guys to work on, are you digging in like, kind of, okay, we're only looking at corner threes or only looking at, at you know, catch and shoot threes from, from these areas or something like that? Or are you just sticking with the, with the very basic kind of, uh, uh, you know, basketball reference top line stats? Well, the first part in the overview, if you guys can see on the, on the presentation, that, that's kind of the baseline stuff, right? So the stuff you can get, you know, on basketball reference and, and, and whatnot. When we start going into their offense and defensive uh, oh, like right up, we'll incorporate a little bit more. Like for example, so and so, you ranked in the bottom ten in contesting shots. So we need to work on stick hand closeouts, where when you close, your hands can't be down. They got to be high. You got to have a high stick hand. That's going to make a difference. And then we have stats like uncontested versus contested. You know, so. Our guys, if we can tell them you're a bottom half at that or bottom third in that, it's important. Um, and the same thing with the charges. Like, that's a big thing for me. And, and we have a great example in Mo and Bradley Beal because they're top one and four in the league in taking charges. If they're doing it, and especially Bradley, who's an all-star, then why can't you do it, right? Unless you're a shot blocker, which we don't have, we need to be taking charges. Um, and, and, and then we can get into like, like the same thing with box outs. We have this ball in the air. When the shot goes up, how mu- does a guy move forward? Does he move back? Does he turn and look or does he just stand? And like, it's, it's amazing the technology that we have through these cameras that are really, really beneficial. And, and what's really good there, Mike, is that you're combining some like, you're, you're combining some raw data and some stats but you're putting it in context with them. And Seth, like this might get to your point, and this is a little bit what we spoke about last week of like, like, like he's saying, hey, I, you took 60 charges, and for a guy it's like, well, what does that mean? Well, it means you were best in the league or your second – or for us, like we just did some uh, this week, and it's like, hey, of all the power forwards in our league, you are the lowest defensive rebounding rate. So I'll put that into – rather than telling him he's got 11% defense rebound rate, say you were the worst defensive rebounder at your position in the entire league. Like that all of a sudden speaks volumes. Or, hey, you were the third best offensive rebounding perimeter player in the league. Can we get to first? And like Terry Stotts like, was the original guy to talk about that. And he kind of said, like, I'm not against advanced stats, but I think there needs to be another level to kind of add context to it so it's more powerful. And, Mike, that's why I love kind of what you're saying is – you're putting that context where a guy can kind of look and be like, hey, I can, I can say whatever I want, but if you're telling me I'm in the bottom three in the NBA uh, or, you know, in the bottom percentage in the NBA, like there's nothing else you can really say back to the coach at that point. So I love that point, Mike. Well, I, I got to agree with you on that. Like, listen, these guys that we get, they are smart basketball players. They might not understand all the per 36 and per that. It's however we're going to get their attention, right? And, and, and the thing that we just have to be careful, and I'm sure you have the same problem, is, is the sensitivity part. Correct. And it's like anything else. It's not what you say, it's how you say it or how you present it, right? And, and, and that's a big part of, of, of my job. And that's why when I go back to the self-evaluation, look, I can't tell Bradley Beal, you know, you're one of the worst uh, uh, contest guys in the league. I got to say, no, Brad, listen, I got a great example of you in a closeout where you ran Kobe White off the three-point line and then you came back in and we call it a runoff recover. Like you recovered back and challenged him twice. So I want to show him that. But I'm also going to say, hey, Brad, here's like three or four where 
you just ran him off the line and then you leaked out. And if you would have came back in the play, he would have missed or you could have gotten the, uh, the defensive rebound. So and once again, it's however you can do it because we all have to be creative, right? We all have to be careful of our, of our players' egos. Everybody's sensitive. Nobody wants to be picked on. Not what you, how you say, uh, excuse me, not what you say, how you say it is critical. But I do think, and I will say this, because I've been fortunate to be around LeBron and I've been fortunate to be around KG, Paul Pierce, Yao Ming. Like, like you have to be truthful with these guys. Like if, and I'm not saying you don't want to be an irritant where like you're constantly, you know, annoying to them, but you got to tell them the truth and, and they need to hear it because if you don't, then they're just going to continue to do whatever they're doing. You know, and then what you got to hope for is when they do do it, you got to damn well make sure you praise them for it because then they're going to do it again. And that's just basic coaching philosophy, right? Um, and I've been fortunate because we have all this at our access instantaneously. I started in the video room. Like these projects, like there's some coaches that probably give them to, you know, video guys and, and, and video interns. I do all this myself because number one, I know how to do it. And I think if you want to get something done correctly, then the best way to do it is to do it yourself. Um, but I know with your resources and stuff, that's where you got to pick what's important, right? I think that's the number one thing. Hey, uh, Zach and Mike, I, I wanted to tell you, and I know Seth is on as well, but to me, with all the, with all the availability of analytics at the NBA level, it's not like that in college. Like you, you can't come up with this stuff in college. It doesn't exist. The infrastructure's not there. And you kind of have to, uh, you know, I, I call it MacGyvering it. Like, you got to MacGyver it. Like, we're doing it with toothpicks and rubber bands, and uh, you're putting whatever you can together. But nothing resonates with the players, to, in my mind, like rankings. And because that's just the, that's the one thing. It's, it's like, you go, listen, you're, you're, either, you're either in the upper echelon or you're somewhere in the middle or you're, or you're toward the lower end. And those are powerful, powerful motivational tools. Um, and then the other thing, Mike, I wanted to commend you on, uh, and Jonah, I think, can speak to this. Uh, like, if you got Mo Wagner to take some charges, uh, the only charges he took in L.A. was when he couldn't get out of the way in time. So that's, that's incredible. I didn't know that. I haven't had time to track it. But for whatever, whatever you've done, I can tell you that's, that's a change in him. Yeah, you know what? Give him credit. And, he, and Clay, he would have led the league this year if he didn't get hurt for the extended period of time. I really believe that, you know. Good for him. Yeah. Us to up the, uh, the budget down there. And Clay, you got to tell us to up the budget down there. You sound like you're an NAIA school. You are Division One. You know, what about us D3 guys? Jesus. We can't keep pace with some of the other schools in the league, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Longabari's talking about Auburn, how they play offense. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, listen, I've watched five guys. So I've watched five college games this year. I was just impressed. I'm sure there's a ton of college teams that play at a faster pace. But I did watch a team like you were talking about that ran fluff for about 30 seconds, or excuse me, 25 seconds. And I'm like, what are we doing here? Yeah. Alabama played fast too, really fast. Yeah. Great stuff, Mike. All right. Uh, all right. And then I'm going to get into this real quick. And I got a couple, oh, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. So now we talked about it. Like we said, we self-evaluate, we evaluate our team. And, 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 and most of that is, is, is write-ups on paper. And, and the same thing with the players. We evaluate them. We do a write-up. Now we go into the video part. And this is like, this is kind of like my wheelhouse. This is what I really, really enjoy to do. Uh, I've been fortunate, like I said, when I came into the league, I worked for Jeff Van Gundy, and, and he had a, a, a defensive playbook uh, that we did, a defensive slash teaching tape that we did at the end of every season. And this thing is about an hour long, and it starts, you know, and as you can see on the screen here, you, you can always do an offensive playbook with concepts and then getting back into this defensive playbook. I break it down into situations. That's a big thing for me. I'm always looking at situations that are happening in the game. Is it transition? Is it individual? Is, are we helping post, pick and roll, DHO, catch and shoot, how, rebounding, and GP is for great player. 
where we have our specialty package, where we're going to go to uh, adjustments that need to be ha need to happen uh, versus a great all star type player. Uh, this has been amazing for me. Um, it's it's first of all, it gives me a, a chance to commend our guys because I only take the best examples of each situation with our coverages to use. So like if they make the, the defensive teaching tape, it's almost like an accomplishment for them per se. Um, and then you start going into your projects, right? You have your Zooms and, and you could start doing personnel on other players. You could study for us, zone is a big thing because we don't see it that much. And, and um, you know, whatever it may be, uh, zoning baseline out of bounds, zoning side out of bounds, switching, uh, whatever happen may come up that you know that's going to be, that you may see for next year or you saw this year that you weren't prepared for that you can work on. And all that stuff is basic uh, self-explanatory. But, but the one thing I want to share with you guys uh, that we did, that we are doing right now uh, with our team, and it's been tremendous, um, is this Zoom project where we broke into small groups. So what we've done is we've had four groups. We have four players in a group, and one group has three. And we have a big staff, so we have three coaches in the group and then a video guy, whether it's the video coordinator or assistant video coordinator. And so there's about eight total. And we've assigned the groups. And our attendance has been really strong under the circumstances that we're not by each other. And we did something unique where we didn't assign Brad or John to a group. We had them be like roamers. So today when we had our session, which I just had about an hour before this one, Brad popped on. And it was great because what we decided to do was go through our playoff series from three seasons ago where John and Brad played together. So John's been out this whole year. We're getting him back next year. We want our younger players to really see what it's like to play with John and Brad together and also show them what it's like to play in a tough intensity playoff setting that hopefully we're going to get to one day uh, with the Wizards. Um, it's been tremendous. I think it's been, we've, we've kind of expanded them a little bit. My goal, what I wanted to do was uh, to, to really challenge them mentally. We all know the physical part of the game, the skill part of the game, but I really believe this in my experience, and I'm sure you coaches feel the same way. When you have to play that team that you know is the best in your league, or when you're in that conference tournament, it's hard to win with, with non-intelligent players. And that's my thing that I've tried to really, really stress to them during this time is to, uh, to really focus on seeing the game like a coach. So what we did with our group, we, we would send them the game, they would watch it, and we'd meet on Tuesday. And then after that, we'd send them the next game, we'd meet on Friday. So we just finished our 12th game because we had six games with Atlanta. We have six games with Boston. And now our last game is going to be on Tuesday, game seven. And what we had our group do, and this might be an exercise for you guys, and, and once again, I know it could be difficult, but we had them pick one qu clip on offense, one clip on defense, and then we, they were basically the coach and they ran the session, just like I'm doing right now. All right, Thomas Bryant, you're up. Run your clip. Okay, let the clip play. Then we rewind it back. All right, TB, talk us through the clip. Well, coach, you know, Boston came down, they ran this wedge action. They were trying to get IT in the pick and roll. This is what we did. This is what worked. This didn't work. Maybe coach, what do you think? Should we have done this? And to me, like, that's like progress. To get our guys talking our language, thinking basketball, other than just picking out the effort plays, because they all can do that. And, and it struggled, like, I just didn't say struggle. It, it took to like this second series for them to start thinking like that. Like I said, I know you guys know who's playing hard and whatnot. Let's look at the adjustments that they're making. Let's look at, you know, the possible um, situations that were, were good or not good and, and, and what, like lineups. 
How did they play? Were they big? Were we small? Getting back to like I talked about in the beginning of the year. So it was really, really good. Um, I have six clips I want to show you. Like we can, we can basically do the session uh, here with us, whatever we have, 20 guys. Uh, you could be the Washington Wizards right now. Um, and I think you're going to see a couple actions that you might like. Uh, and then also some adjustments that were made to those actions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because I know we're getting a little late, but, but I want to run these six clips because, once again, I think, I think it could be interesting to uh, stimulate you guys a little bit. Coach, we've been going two or three hours sometimes, so we got, okay. we got, we got plenty of time. Okay. All right. All right, guys. So I'm going to run these clips, and uh, I'll talk you through them. And uh, hold on one second. Let me get this thing rolling. Okay. All right. So how, how is the video? G guys, give me some feedback here. How does the video look? I know it might be a little choppy. If there's any problems, please unmute. Tell me to stop. Uh, I think it's best that if I let, let me run the clip first, then I can rewind it. Then we could start talking and then go through the clip again. Does that sound good? Thumbs up. Okay, good. All right. First action. Here we go. I'm going to run the clip and then we'll, we'll talk it through. Okay. You guys, you guys, uh, um, how many, how many of, of you all are seeing this type of action, uh, and having problems with it, like it, don't like it. Just let, let's elaborate from there. So this might not be a common common set for you guys. We're seeing it a ton, Mike. Fran's doing this a ton. Okay, he's doing so. So he, in the end, screening that and that guy a ton. Okay, so in the NBA, you know, we call this delay action, and, and what delay means is it's basically five out on the perimeter. Um, once again, people ask all the time, right? And I'm sure you guys are interested in too. Like, what man? Give me some good plays. Give me some good sets. And I really believe this, and it'd be interesting to see what Clay thinks about this as well. I don't think it's plays, it's definitely players. Um, and for Boston in this situation, um, they have a five who's very versatile in Al Horford, especially three years ago. Al might be slowing down a little bit, but, but three years ago, he, he's really, really a hard to guard uh, center because he can shoot, he can roll, he can dribble, and he can pass. So this action right here, delay, is what I call Jay Crowder setting a pin down into a dribble handoff. And especially with Avery Bradley, uh, from a scouting report perspective, he's always in the left corner. And he's always in the left corner because he comes off so strong and hard to his right hand. So as you can see, there's not great ball pressure on Al, right? One of my teaching points that I make when we go over walkthrough is we never want our, the bigs to dribble down. We want them to dribble out, and we want them to dribble up. So the handoff is, at the very least, the three-point line because then that puts a lot of pressure on the corner man. So as you can see, Avery sets his man up, and Avery's very physical. I had the opportunity to coach him as a rookie in Boston. Uh, extremely, really, really expand his, expanded his game from when he first came into the league. But when he comes off to his right hand, he's really, really dynamic. Now, they decide to go under, and they actually go under two. Um, if you can see Brandon Jennings right here, go under two, and then he gets clipped on the screen. Avery's able to get a one-dribble rhythm pull-up. Now, whatever we could talk about in the next clip, the adjustment – that was made uh, as the series went on because he started to play better and better. Um, so like, once again, you guys are the wizards. We're pulling up these clips. We're talking about this example. Now, the one thing we'll go to next is, and I'll run the clip and explain after it's finished of the adjustment that we made to this action. Now the clip is a little bit different, but it's really the same thing. Okay, and let me run this back. Okay, so basically it didn't start 
with Al in the beginning of the floor, excuse me, start with the ball in the beginning, uh, excuse me, in the middle of the floor, they set a little, you know, horns action. They forced the switch, okay? But now, freeze it, Al's at the top. Now they'll look at this post up with Jay, they'll give it a, a 1,001, 1,002, all right? They don't like it. Now what it basically becomes, okay, is delay. Crowder's making his way to the right corner, and now we have five out. Now the adjustment that was made by the Wizards here is they're going to switch into a blow-up. And what I call a blow-up is they're not going to let Avery Bradley get the ball. But the reason why it works is they're able to switch up to get into his airspace, to take away his momentum. But more importantly, A number one on this clip is if we watch Gortat's ball pressure, it's night and day to the previous one. And then we wind up forcing the travel. Mike, Mike, can you run it back to the, the first delay clip? And, and by the way, like for us, we didn't see much delay at all. Okay. Uh, and my, my impression is that, like, I think it's a recruitment thing. I think you can, can teach, you know, guys that, that can read and react off of that stuff. And, and if the first option is taken away, they can go to the second. But we didn't hardly see it at all. But what I was going to ask you is that on the weak side with Boston, like, did you teach this? Uh, we, we call it a pairs action. Like, did you teach this little pairs action, or are those guys just doing that? Okay, so you're talking offensively or defensively? Offensively. So, so offensively, when we run delay, we just, we just call it – we just pin into DHO. We don't have a pairs terminology per se. It's just really emphasize the big – getting that dribble handoff inside the three-point line. And then the guy flying off like Brad, who will run this for occasionally, really coming off aggressively so that he can get downhill. The reason why I like this play, if you have a really talented um, offensive player who can put the ball on the floor and attack the rim, and the screener on the pin downs a shooter, you're creating single side bumps. Are you guys familiar with that terminology, single side bumps? Of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so you guys are good with that. So to me, like, that's one of the hardest things in the NBA to guard is when Al Horford – like, let's say Brandon Jennings didn't go over the top. He it didn't go underneath. He goes over the top. Al Horford rolls. That puts a lot of pressure on Otto Porter to help on the roll. Then you're giving up a wide-open three to Jay Crowder, right? So, so we didn't call it pairs. We just called it pin DHO action. Okay. But I do like that terminology. And let me write that down. That's Mike, what, I, what I'm really talking about is what's happening on the weak side. Where is that? Is that uh, smart and IT? Yeah, smart and IT. They just exchange. Yeah, so I can't tell if, if, like, for us, we would actually have Marcus Smart set like a little flare for IT. Yeah. I can't tell if they're just exchanging, or if they're just playing, or if that's like a, actually part of the play to occupy the. Because clearly. Is that Beal that's guarding uh, IT? Yeah, Beal's on IT, yep. I, can, yeah. I can't see it very well. But clearly, Beal gets occupied way more than I would want him to be that far away from the ball. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if you taught that. Like, is that part of what you taught, or are those guys just doing that on their own? You're talking about Beal on defense, right? I'm talking about, I'm talking about smart and okay. IT. With no, okay, no, I, am, I understand what you're saying. So to me, for us – we do have some actions where we do flare. Then we have some actions where we do screen in, especially okay. like depending on how, how they're playing it. Like I, I know just going through this series, they really were like really, really over committing to IT, like almost boxing one-ish. Like yeah. very little help off him. And that's why Brad did that. So I think for Boston's sake, they really weren't worrying about occupying the defense. They were just more getting the space. Yeah, he's com like Beal's completely hugged up with his yeah. with his head to the ball, you know, the back of his head to the ball. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Hey Clay, I, hey Clay, a lot of the Princeton teams we see at my at our level, like they'll go spread and get into what's delay. They'll run that flare on the weak side that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we teach that and drill it like crazy. We call it pairs action. It's a weak side, you know. It's weak side, and it doesn't have to be a flare. It can be one of many things. There's two man, two man action, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And I'll just, I'll just add, uh, coach, just so you know, too, like in college. So like what I would say that this action where, where we probably see it the most common is in some form of like Euro ball screen continuity. Okay. So there's like open side ball screen action, empty yeah. ball screen action on one side. So the, where Brandon Jennings is, like his defender, like in college, like he's for most, most teams, he's going to be like midline. Yep. And then there'll be top, the top guy will come, he'll pin down, and then they'll get into that, like in a Euro action where like then he'll screen. So like you're just adding a little bit different element in college with the fact that there's no 2-9 in there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, no, I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying. But I, once again, I think this is a great action if you have these players, right? Number one, you got Avery Bradley coming off to his right hand. And for Boston, the one thing that they have the luxury of is they have IT in the right corner coming off to his left, and you got Avery Bradley in the left corner coming off to his right. So, and then you have Al Horford at the top who can play make. So, yes, this is a good play, particularly for them. But if Al Horford can't handle the ball, right, or he can't shoot, then you could do the sag mentality that Utah does with Gobert. And I'm throwing reference points if you guys watch Brooklyn with Jared Allen. He does if a, if a big can't shoot, Jared Allen when once Al Horford's bringing the ball up the court. Hold on, Jared Allen would be damn near at the restricted line. And then what they'll do is play on the top side of Avery Bradley, saying you're not coming up this way. You're going to have to back cut. But you do that if it's Al Horford because he's always a threat to make threes and and be able to play make. Um, but what I do like is this next clip is just this adjustment, right? Little subtle adjustment where you got similar size, great ball pressure, take it away, force a travel. And that's what we call, once again, ball pressure, switch into a blow up. Hey, Mike, question for you, as, and it will really pertain to this being, this is a playoff series. Um, so how many, like when you go into a series and you know, like, you know what they're going to run, you know, their sets, you know, some stuff like how, like, how, how do you play your hand? How do you hold on to your adjustments? When do you try to show them so that they can't make that second adjust, uh, adjustment? You know what I mean? As the series goes back and forth. Well, I think the one thing you want to do is you're going to start right away, to be honest. Like, I don't want Avery Bradley coming off to his right hand. So if they're adjusting to him going to his left, that's good for us because I know playing the percentages with all the analytic data we get when he goes to his left, he's not nearly as effective as he goes to his right. And then that's going to put us in a good position to be successful. You know, so look, we started the playoff series when I got to Cleveland because uh, I joined them mid season. Uh, we played Detroit and we were him and harm. Should we blitz to start or save it? Doc was a big believer in you don't start, because then you show your hand, you got nothing else to go to. But Ty was like, screw it. We're going with the blitz. And it actually was really, really good. And it worked for us. Now, was the blitz good for us? One of the main reasons was the bottom man was usually LeBron James. So when we put two on the ball with Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond rolled to the hole, Bron's anticipation was amazing. Doesn't get enough credit for that. But he could also hold up a role. If you don't have LeBron James down there or back there and Drummond's rolling to the rim and you have a shorter guy and then he's coming uh, and providing no resistance, then you're going to give up layups and fouls and they're going to get whatever they want. You know, so we just said we were going to be aggressive. But that's, you know, once again, you got to go with your gut. You got to trust it. I just listened to a great podcast and Teddy's on the call now um, from the attorney general about leadership. And all great leaders, what they do is they do their research, they prepare, but then you have to make a decisive decision. And sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. But at the end of the day, you got to be willing to live with the result. Like, that's what I always say to our guys. Like, people talk about, like, the pick and roll, like, like oh, man, it's, you know, we got crushed in the pick and roll. Well, you know what? Every team gets crushed in the pick and roll. But the one thing you can control is transition defense, not turning the ball over, getting back. Let's take away those easy baskets because we know they're going to score some in the pick and roll action. So that's where I go back to, yeah, you may run the, run the 
the blitz option, or you may go under and you may get burned. Some guys make some threes, but are you willing to put your head down on the pillow at the end of the day and say, Hey, you know what? I did my research and, and this is what I decided to go with. And it didn't work because you know, what's funny, the late grade flip Saunders and you guys, I mean, you guys, do you guys all remember when LeBron went off first Detroit when he was in Cleveland before he went to Miami? So they played Detroit. He, I mean, it's ridiculous. They play it on NBA TV every once in a while. Like he had, I don't know, 20 something straight points to end the game in overtime. He was a monster. And Flip's whole thing was he still didn't want to double team LeBron, but the players convinced him to double him. And then I think in the next game, the closeout game, Booby Gibson had a career high of like eight threes. And so you got to pick your poison, right? And that's where it's, it's hard. I, I, I got to believe, I know it's harder for us. At, at your level, you're the coach, you're in control. I don't know, a guy's going to really question your decision-making. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But like for us, that, those are the hardest days. And I've had some tough guys in walkthroughs. I've had Rondo, I've had Paul Pierce, I've had KG. Then I have LeBron, and you better be on with LeBron, right? Because if you're not, and the same thing with Rondo. Like, if you don't have your shit together and when LeBron says, we need to do this, well, hey, Bron, if we do this, you know, this is what's going to happen. And he usually knows that anyway. But he may do that to test you. But you got to be on it. And that's, that's really, like you said, we make, we make a decision, we live with the results. Mike, jo Jonah and Zach Hamer and I had the pleasure of having both Rondo and LeBron. So that was a treat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably... <laughs> <laughs> probably a lot like uh, probably like having Rondo and KG and and Pierce together. But I think Rajan has gotten a lot better since he's been older. Well, like, I have nothing to compare it to, but I I know those guys would uh, they would test each other at times to see yeah. who the smartest guy in the room was. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, listen. I got stories, but I have all good stories because I think at the end of the day with those guys, I do feel confident that they know I did everything I possibly could. You know, we won a lot of games. We were really successful. And, you know, when we got to Golden State, when they got Duran, it became like damn near impossible to defend them. You know, it's funny, like and Nick Nurse is a, a phenomenal coach. If you guys get a chance to study him, he's phenomenal. And, and, and I don't want to take anything away from their championship, but like he ran into what we were fortunate to have. No, no, no KD, right? Or, or he's out. That's what happened when we won in 2016. We just had Clay and Steph. But in 17 and 18, we had Clay, Steph, and KD, who was the MVP. And then it became, well, we can't help off this guy, you know, because now he's going to be open. We can't help off that guy because then that guy's going to be open. And then, well, what the hell are we going to do? And, and it, it was just, they were just on a total another level once they got him. All right, let me go to the next set. I'm going to just let it run and then I'll run it back and then uh, we can elaborate. And then, just take a look, guys, too. Um, you know, this is in the third quarter. And the next clip will be in the fourth quarter. So you can see the adjustment that was made. So this is one of Boston's plays. And Brad, Brad I don't, Clay, you got to help me out with this one and Jonah, too. I don't know if a lot of teams ran this action. Uh, I think Washington with Randy Whitman might have ran it a little bit. But I always feel, I feel like Boston's the one team that, um, that comes to my mind with this action. So this is basically side out of bounds, which we get a lot of, which you all know, like it's reverse in the NBA. We get all side out of bounds and we get no baseline out of bounds and you guys get all baseline out of bounds, right? And no side out of bounds. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so all, most of our stuff is side out of bounds, but basically this is just a zipper into a step up. And what, what, what Boston does is really good is they slide Kelly Olenek along the baseline. And, and then they'll, they'll have, a, you know, a, a, a solid three-point shooter. And Avery Bradley is a solid three-point shooter in the corner, you know. Um, and then, once again, this becomes hard to defend because, number one, you got Isaiah Thomas coming off. But number two, you got Al Horford uh, popping instead of rolling. 
So now you got to recover back because that's what he's capable of doing is making those threes. And by sliding Olenek along the baseline, right, that kind of pulls the help because now your help guy becomes Otto Porter and then he's a little leery because then Avery Bradley can back cut. So this to me is a really, really difficult set with a obvious dynamic point guard in Isaiah and a really solid three-point shooter in the corner. And the other thing that's dangerous about this play too, if, if you uh, write up a report on Avery Bradley from a personnel perspective, Jonah, what else are you putting besides his three-point shooting? Cutter. He's a great cutter. Not a good cutter, a great cutter. So it puts a lot of pressure on your defense, right? And now it's the fourth quarter. So here's their adjustment. Let's watch it, and then we can talk about it right after. So it's a little different action. They didn't start the same, but they're eventually going to get to the same action, like a high slash step up. Um, let me run it and then I'll, and then we'll go back. This was a really, really good possession for us defensively, especially in the fourth quarter, you know, money time, the game is tight. This was a big, big possession. Now it's not exact same thing where it's a zip step up, like, He's running some fluff action. He's trying to score, but basically right now, it almost becomes the same thing. The only thing that's different is Bradley's handling the ball, and Olenek doesn't slide along the baseline. He stays uh, on the opposite block, which actually helps their adjustment because what they do now is, is they rotate out of the corner. Otto Porter does. Now Markeith Morris rotates to Crowder. And then Gortat goes right to um, Kelly Olenek. What I like about this adjustment, and it's interesting because I was in Cleveland at the time. We were playing the winner of this series. This is how we decided to defend them because we didn't want Al Horford to get a wide open three, but we also didn't want him to generate speed coming off the pops. And when we closed to him, he had to dribble to his left hand, which he wasn't as comfortable doing. But you could see right here, by just pulling over, it screws up their timing and rhythm. And now everybody's able to recover back. Now, this wasn't executed like totally clean. Like Otto, I'm not even sure if Otto was just trying to stunt, but it becomes a basic full rotation type situation. And it kind of made Al reload and uh, regroup his, his position. And then now the shot clock's winding down. You got Marcus Smart with the ball, which is good. Close out to Avery Bradley. He didn't get a shot off. Now he's got a dribble left, which he's not good at. Great contest. That's a great possession right there. Any questions on that, guys? My question to you is how many, how many of you have a big that can, can, can pop and roll? Anybody? We will. Yeah. We now, will. We just got a roller, Mike. Okay. Yeah. So you have a roller. All right. Um, we, he, can about, short it. he can short it a bit, though. Yeah. What, so I'm sorry. The coach that has, a, um, that has, has a, a popper that's a five, have you, been, have you watched a lot of this Al Horford stuff, or what are you doing with your five? I mean, we run a lot of high-low action, to be honest with you. We've got both four and five that can shoot it. Okay. Um, so we can use both those guys to kind of space. Um, we have one – I would say we have one guard that's kind of dynamic in pick and roll. Okay. So that limits us a little bit from some of the ball screen stuff that we can do with some of the other guys. But where we got him – where we got him the most shots on probably pick – was probably out of horns, some version yeah. of horns – Horns action, but but the like when you just showed the first clip with Al, like I was like that that's going to be one of our sideline sets for next year. Yeah, <laughs> so um, so yeah, this is this is obviously very good stuff. Now just be ready. Like and the good thing is, I, I mean, I, we all don't know what the other coaches will counter, but this is a good 
counter with a full rotation adjustment, you know. Um, but but yeah, I feel like it's still hard to guard. But I, I but like once again, the purpose of this exercise, we're, I'm going through this with our team, and showing them the, the playoffs, right? So now they ran this play in the third quarter, and we gave up a three. But now it's the fourth quarter money time, and this is the adjustment we made. All right. And these are, these are the last two clips that I have for you guys. So just run it through. And, and this is just the basic 1-4 pick and roll. And then they go into a 1-4 step up. Okay. So, and then IT winds up scoring on Marquis. So this is a basic play, right? So to me, right here, I think what they're trying to do is show but he's a little flat. He's able to get back, but now Crowder gets him off balance. And then now it becomes no show. It becomes a switch, which if you're watching these games like we have, Markeith Morris versus Isaiah Thomas wasn't very successful in switching situations um, throughout the course of the series. And it's going on, we're on game six right now. Now this is like, as a coach, this is probably what you don't want to have happen right? It's the fourth quarter, two minutes to go. Their best player has the ball and you're at a disadvantage, right? So they come down the next play and I'll let it run minute 21. And then their adjustment right there was to just attack the ball. And the thing that, as you can see the NBA little chess match, right? So what the Wizards did and this is what we're trying to tell our guys to get them to think the game, right? So Brad is intelligent coach. The Wizards adjust and put Markeith Morris on Marcus Smart. So instead of sending up Crowder, then they send up Smart. And then the adjustment here was fourth quarter. We're down five. We just got beat with this play probably two possessions ago. Now we're going into our blitz, even with a four man with full rotation, we impact the trap, we get a turnover, and next thing you know, Brad Beal makes a three, cuts the game to two, and then John Wall makes a game-winning three. They won game, the Wizards, we won the game by one. So, so this- Hey, hey Mike, hey Mike I, I, Joe Griffin, I got a question for you. This is great stuff. So if you, if you, if you factor in shot selection on this, your first clip that you came down where Avery Bradley got the pin down DHO and he pulled up for about a 21 footer, you know, like about the longest two that he could get and he made it. Wouldn't you guys consider that in that time and score situation, good defense. And then now the IT shot in the corner against the switch against Mar Marcus Morris, another long two. And then the play after that, then you guys decide to trap the ball screen to get it out of his hand. What, I mean, wouldn't you guys consider that good defense? by giving up that contested long two-pointer? I'll agree with you, but I'll disagree in, in this regard. I know then this is where, and not that I don't disagree with the analytics, um, um, but, but I know when Avery Bradley comes off to his right hand and he has rhythm, I know it's a two-point shot, it's not a three. That's one that he will make at a higher percentage, right? I think it's 53%. For, for the numbers to be, uh, to, 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 to not give up. Like, you know, if a guy shoots 53% from two, then you don't want to give up those shots. Now, what I do know about Avery Bradley is, is if he has to dribble to his left hand or if he doesn't get the ball going up, then he's going to be frustrated and then he's probably going to be pissed and then he's probably not going to cut as hard and then that's going to be a win for us. As far as Isaiah Thomas goes, I think all bets are off with the analytics. He, this year, he was too dominant a player. He was in the running for MVP. I don't care what they say about, you know, twos, threes with him, all bets are off. And that's just me going in through my preparation, having coached him before and seeing his body of work for the year. I'm not living with him making over Markeith. They may have to throw it back to Jay Crowder to throw it back to uh, Marcus Smart to make, and then that's the one I'd be willing to live with to, to answer your question. But, but you're, you're right on. Like, like I'll, say, I'll say this, two years ago in Cleveland, we're playing Brooklyn, D'Angelo Russell, 
who had an all-star year, but still the numbers with him in the pick and roll was to let him play back in the drop, let him come off, and then jack up long twos. He did that the whole game, and he was playing into our hands. We wound up not fouling on a three, um, and um, shit, who was it on their team made it. Game goes into overtime. Go into overtime, D'Angelo starts to heat up, goes into a second overtime, heats up, and all those twos that we were willing to live with, I want to say he made four straight of them. So it's like, that's where you got to, I know those guys that are behind the computer tell you what the machine spits out, but that's where feel of the game, you have to go with your gut, you know. Because I know one thing that's definitely real, and I'm sure it happens at every level, but when a guy feels it, it doesn't matter. Like they think the basket is the size of the ocean. And the whole thing is how can you prevent that from happening? And the other thing in my opinion is if I take the ball out of, out of his hands and he's been shooting all these shots, now it goes to somebody who hasn't been shooting. Even if they may be a decent shooter, what's their rhythm like? Yo, know, I, I would, I, I'm, I concur with, with Mike on the, especially the Isaiah Thomas situation in those days, like when he was grooving, you know, throw, throw the other stuff out the window. Like it did, it didn't matter. Like you could not give him, if he got an eyelash of a, of a opening, he was just incredible. So as the guy behind the computer, here's what I'd say. And I'd, I'd, I'd agree with coach on, on both those, but for slightly different reasons uh, on, on the IT one, like you just okay the shot he ended up with there may not have been a great shot but you're going to say that you're you give him 10 chances to go one on one against Markeith Morris and that's the worst that's going to happen from Boston's perspective and that's a shot he can still make so even though on that that particular time he didn't get a great shot you're still like okay that's the floor the ceiling is is pull up threes is is and ones at the basket um, so it, if you, it's not just like the shot that it ends up with, it's the situation that got you there. And on the, the previous one, the, the, uh, Avery Bradley one, like, yeah, he ends up with the pull up 21 footer, but if you, if on that clip, you, you stop it, you know, just a half account earlier, you look at the catch he gets on that. He's, he, he may decide to take a dribble and step in, but he catches the ball open in the slot and you don't like, um, if he, if he, instead of, instead of taking that one dribble in, just like rises up for that, like that, that three pointer off the DHO, now you feel really terrible about your, about, about your defensive possession. So I think that, that looking at the whole of the situation, not just the actual shot they ended up with, like what position you're putting yourself in by guarding it a certain way, I think we end up at the same point. I definitely, I agree with that. It's just, I just know when I'm sitting there and, and you just see these guys, that's the beauty of our game, right? We are have, we have the best of the best. And that when these guys are rolling, like we played uh, Chicago this year and, and Zach Levine goes off and I'm kicking myself that we should have, we should have trapped him. But then I go back and evaluate the game and he has like 30 something points, but really about, I don't know, 17 of them are in transition because we didn't get back or we had blown coverages. And that's where I go back to my point. Everybody wants to complain about trapping and pick and roll coverages. How about we get back in transition? How about we don't turn the ball over? How about we finish at the rim so we can set our defense? And then maybe he doesn't get 17 of those. Maybe he gets eight. And then now his feeling is not the same because I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Like, how many of you guys, like, and even the small colleges, like, you play against a guy that you're fearful that he could go for, like, 30 points? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Now, have you guys messed with gimmicks on, like, like uh, double teaming, uh, getting the ball out of their hands, denials, and so on and so forth? I probably should have. And we, we played in the state semifinals, and they had a kid that he had 40. And he's like, I don't know, he scored like almost 3,000 points in Philadelphia. Um, and I, like, 
after the game, I literally remember being like, shit, I should have done what they do to Harden and just run a double at him as soon as he crosses half court. Yeah. And just playing rotation. And I think if I ever come in that situation again with a kid like that, I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Just to kind I mean, of – It sucks. You live and learn, right? But, but Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, and everybody's the best Monday morning quarterback coach yeah. there out there, right? He, I mean, I mean they, they would just literally – he'd come down, they'd go four flat. And, like, that's how they kind of played. And he built a program to do that. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you just couldn't guard – like, you just couldn't guard the kid. And he's, you know – making tough shots and just in the middle of the game, I was like, should we do this? And I, you know, you kind of live with what you got, but that's Mike, Mike, we did something interesting with AJ green from Northern Iowa. It's not something trap with a trap, but it was something like a gimmick. It was late. It was late in the uh, first half with, he was dribbling the ball up the court. And like, we had talked about it a bunch. They go one, four flat, like late, late, uh, late half, late clock, whatever it is. And we just, we hopped into a three, two. And then, it was literally him against our three, two, and he just took a bullshit three. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like that's something we might go to more next year just to, you know, mess with teams. I, I don't know if, you've, if you really see that in the NBA, but it was something interesting. So he sees three jerseys. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that. You know, like what 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 will happen in the NBA, if you watch Steve Clifford in Orlando, like the end of the now, – now Harden, they may do it a little bit earlier, but let's say it's, it's someone like along that lines, but maybe not as dynamic. Mm. Uh, like he'll end a quarter when the team goes, he'll just run somebody right at him. Yeah. To make that guy have indecision. He calls it a hit. Uh, and then just to make that guy pass and then play out, make somebody else make a shot. And the big thing with that, it's not only just getting the ball out of their hands, but if you can get the right timing down yeah. so that they get, they get out of their hands. So now when that ball's passed and maybe pass one more time, man, Oh shit, I got to get the shot off. And it, and it makes it a harder, more difficult shot. Yeah, and it's like a mirage, too, because, like, he just saw we were in a zone and he just called out a man play. I don't know. I mean, it's something maybe some some other guys on this call could use, but it's just confusing when you're calling. Like, it, they basically tried to get to that kind of step up with their big, and, like, it just turned into a zone and nothing happened. He just took a three and it was end of the half. Like, just like a small victory that you have, and, like, I think that sort of cancels out, like, some of that feel you were talking about. Like, he's going in the half with doubt of the last shot he just took, and he's just super confused, like, just what happened. But, so... I guess the big we had the uh, we had the SEC's leading scorer. Uh-huh. Basically, the only the only strategy we saw that was ever somewhat effective. Like nobody and we put him in pick and roll a ton. He was basically he started power forward for us. He's really a natural two guard, but with the makeup of our roster, he was a he was a ball handling four. No one ever trapped the pick and roll, and the only strategy we ever saw that was effective is in college, like a lot of people call it face card. I actually would just call it a box and one because uh, the you know the guy guarding him wasn't, wasn't helping. He wasn't paying attention to anybody else. And the only reason that was effective is because he would, he would stop working. He would stop moving. Um, but we never saw – we never saw anybody come out and just fly it out and get the ball out of his hands. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing, too, is you got you to know your team, right? Once again – I keep saying it, but don't be afraid, man. Like, I, 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 and I'm not one of these guys. Like, I don't like, oh, well, because we hear it a lot. Ah, just try anything. I'm not saying that. I'm saying practice it and then just mess with it, even if it is for one situation, end of the quarter, right? You know, like, like the only thing that, the only time I get conservative as a coach is if we do have a lead in the fourth quarter and I don't want to give up a three. So, like, if we have a six-point lead and there's three minutes to go and we've been going against somebody who's who's worthy of a double team, I I, I just – I don't want to do that. I just don't want to give up the three, so I'll pull off the double team, you know, and I'll mention it to coach. And and Scotty's the best. Like, he's usually in agreement. But if he's like, ah, no, let's stay with it, then we stay with it. But for me personally, my philosophy, if we got a lead and it's the fourth quarter, man, I don't want to give up any threes. You know, the game has changed, man. It's like, wow. I was talking with our analytics people the other day, and uh, I don't know how old most of you guys are. You know, I'm 47, and when I grew up playing, and I played small college and high school, like, you always went in to get the rebound, right? Well, I think now in the NBA, it's, it's almost, if you're a small, it's almost you better go back to get the rebound. 
because these balls are going all over the place. I can't tell you how many times, like, I feel like we've lost games because our guys went in and the ball went over their head. And all they had to do was just train themselves to just go back two steps versus go in two steps and we would have gotten the ball, you know? Does that make sense? Like, I don't know, is that, is that kind of trending in the college game? Where, I mean, where guys are just putting up so many threes and the ball's like long shots equal long rebounds. Clay but in I, Arkansas, you do. <laughs> but but yeah. I know, like, I know growing up, like, the way it was, okay, go in to get the rebound. Like, and the next thing you know, the ball's over your head. Yeah, and you see teams with trying to get offensive rebounds, trying to get threes. Like, Davidson, they make an emphasis. They call it, like, a dagger. I mean, it's something yeah. you have to guard and prepare for. Good point. New York. Oh, we try and send our guys to the boxes and elbows. Like, we want the elbows covered. And, you know, there's a little leeway in that. It may be – a foot or two off the elbows, but we send guys, we send our guys to the boxes and elbows. And then, and then obviously with whoever's contested the shot, um, you know, has to get in and help too. We, we send our, we send our uh, point guard to the low conference logo, trying to clean that up. Mike, to your point, we call it long rebound patrol um, where we just try to, you know, he's in charge of kind of that clean up there right around the nail of the free throw line. Um, there's a stat I read where it says essentially uh, 18% of uh, rebounds hit the floor um, before um, they are rebounded, which sounds like an amazing stat that one of every five sh balls hits the floor. But it speaks to what you're saying, Mike, about long rebounds and, and that making sure you're in that vicinity, you're in that elbow area Clay was just talking about. And that's where your guards can have a huge impact on your defensive rebounding. If you can get those five guys involved and you can rebound down, it's huge. Absolutely massive. Can you, can you correct that for us, Seth Partnow? Like, what is, what's the answer to that? Because there's an answer. That, I don't have a specific number. That sounds about right. But Zach said, I think Zach said the thing that I would say is that get it, like the, the spot where there isn't like coverage of people around the rim necessarily getting to is going to be the nail like if you if you want to give yourself the guy the best best chance at at getting one of those long rebounds like more of them are going to end up in like the nail top of the circle area yeah, then, yeah we believe we believe that you know one of the two guys at the elbow has got it he's got to scrape that one out of there we, we yeah. were all, all the time with our guards we talk about flooding the weak side so if you were on the weak side wing weak side corner you're coming down we're going to flood that weak side wing no box out responsibility, get to, uh, get to that weak side block. And then we talk about the guy at the top of the key, our point guard, filling that nail area and being on, you know, being, you know, a big part of our defensive rebounding philosophy. I, I know getting back to what Patrick was saying, when I, when, and when I was coaching in Boston, when I first moved to the bench, you know, this is like when they were really good, but not good enough to beat Miami because LeBron was in Miami they were the best at those offensive rebound threes. Like Tyson Chandler would just tip them out. Next thing you know, J.R. Smith, three. Jason Kidd, three. Steve Novak, three. And then the place is going bonkers. You know, those are the ones like, I'm a big believer in just trying to eliminate any kind of added motivation, confidence to these guys uh, to make it like a um, – more to, to for our advantage to be to be greater. And Jay Wright's thing in the college game is if you can't two hand dunk it, if you can't dunk that offensive rebound, you're looking to kick out. And his concept is they want to get it out and then over. And so you know it was if we can't dunk that offensive rebound, we're getting that out and then we're moving that ball over to the next side of the floor either for a three or or a penetra a penetrating kick and. Uh, this is a little bit for the college game, Mike, and that, like, you know, we, there's a, some coyness that's involved. Like, Texas Tech's big thing was, like, that was found money. And that anything we got offensive rebound was found money. And it's funny, like, we had, you know, the biggest celebrations on the year was when we'd get something off an offensive rebound and our bench is going nuts with the money symbol. And, like, it was, it was amazing how, like, juiced our guys would get like, off that stuff. I like that. I'm going to steal that. So it was the whole thing was found money and our whole bench would be doing the money sign and they'd go bonkers. And like, if the kid missed the shot off and out and over on found money, like the bench would just like, be, it, was, it was awesome. It was fun. I, I like that. Hey, like 
let's do this. We're about two hours in. Um, as we talked about two weeks ago, I think collaboration, and it's good tonight. We got about 22 people with us, but collaboration is really an active endeavor. And it's not just listening and observing. I know not everyone's gotten the chance to speak. So I'm going to break us up into a breakout rooms and just take like 15 minutes. Let's go around. Just there'll be three or four of you guys in each room. Just introduce yourself, tell everyone where you're from. Um, and then just take, you know, just go around. Maybe you can take two, a minute or two to yourself and just think of one off season project that you will do, you know, from now until your season starts, you know, NBA folks, that might be in a couple of weeks, but most of you college and high school guys, you'll have at least a couple of months here. Um, so, you know, it could be something Longo talked about. You can mimic something he did, or it can be something you've always wanted to try that you haven't done yet, or it can just be something you think about on the spot. And then just go around and share it, and other people just ask them clarifying questions and give suggestions on how to maybe improve that person's idea. And then we'll come back as a group and, and close up in about 15 minutes. Any questions with that? Sounds good. I think you have to click accept or join maybe. Joe and Adam. Do you have do you have an invite, Joe? Um uh, I do not. Weird. Um where are you? How about um weird? Let me try. Can you exit and then just come right back? I don't know, something. Yeah. Yeah, do that and I'll you mean, you mean you want me to leave meeting and come back in? Correct. All right, buddy. All right, thank you. Yep. Damn. I'm back. It's like you can't – you're the only one that can't uh, – It's like my me. wife, man, kicking me to the curb, man. <laughs> Sleeping in the basement. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, I don't know why. I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Jonah. Don't sweat it too much, buddy. No, nah, you're good. Uh let me try this. I'm going to try to make you the host and see if that eh, – no, let's try this. So weird. Mm. Uh, I'm going to go check in on some other groups. Okay. I'll hang, I'll hang tight here. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. No problem, buddy. Uh, very good scores in one-on-one -on -one situations, whether it's Giannis getting to the rim or Chris playing in the mid-range. Um, that it, we've really, especially with the kind of more well, teams that have the personnel that they can throw at it um, and more disciplined, more active, more engaged in terms of rotating out of it. Uh, we're, we're seeing that quite a bit more uh, from, from the Bostons, from the Miamis, um, you know, predominantly in the Eastern Conference where I really wanted to take a look at what teams spacing and kind of their principles as far as both maximizing, creating things that for other people, whether it's cutters, uh, spacing on the perimeter, but then also, you know, our main goal is to get these guys, um, you know, opportunities to score. Um, so trying to make teams essentially pay for doubling us, um, but still giving the, them the freedom and space to attack, uh, 
when when a double's not sent or if it's late, if they can get there quick. So that's been a, a pretty big focus for me in this in the hiatus. I low guy. That was the tag guy on every single one. We called that the most important guy, the MIG. And um, that was a term I got from the Bucks. Uh, and it was it was a game changer for our team. But anyway, we were seventh that, in the that country. Was the low man that. you called the MIG? Yeah, the most important guy. So low yeah. man on the double side of a spread pick and roll. And we actually used it even if it wasn't a spread pick and roll situation. So if it was just a you know normal baseline drive or something, you're in the MIG. Um, and that was kind of the norm that we had. But our challenge now is how do we get it to another level? And we forced the – I think we were 27th in the country at forcing turnovers. Um, coach Haas, my head coach, is from the Carolina way, obviously getting up and down and played for Roy and uh, coached under Roy for a long time. So we wanted to find a way in our framework to, to cause more turnovers, cause a little more havoc. Um, you know, the doubling of the post has been – really really good for us it's been it's allowed us to play smaller and more minutes and i think he was 17th in the country overall or something like that the other kid did not pan out and hardly ever played and then we had three sit out transfers so we actually had five new guys on the roster we, had, we only had 12 on scholarship we had an open scholarship uh the entire year um but the other seven guys were all holdovers from mike yeah. Anderson's staff so everything we were teaching them uh, was different than what Mike had taught him. Not, not better, just different. And, and the last thing I'll say is, like, as I looked at it, and, like, I've t talked to Joan about this a little bit, but, like, I had all these preconceived notions going in of what I was going to find as far as – because my whole thing was, like, okay, what do we need to change how we teach? You know, is it mechanics on a closeout? Like, just different I – was, I was interested to see. And, like, ultimately what it came down to is – we started three – we had three freshmen on the floor, like, at all times. And so we were just young. And so, like, as as the year went on, like, our attempts actually went down. Our percentage – our percentage went – our three-point field goal percentage went against, went down to it improved uh, from that standpoint. It's like a lot of it – I mean, not to over – overgeneralize or oversimplify, but, like, experience matters. <laughs> and, like, when you're playing young guys, like – you're just going to be more vulnerable to, to some of those, some of those things. And even in, you know, the difference between three, four, five attempts a game, like, you know, Seth, like it matters, right. The right guys and the, the quality of shots from that standpoint. So I just kind of wanted to pick your brain on that a little bit. Yeah. If you go, if you go pluck out some film and again, it's not perfect. Like it never is, but you'll be, you'll see clips of our team. Um, like Jimmy Witt, our, again, going back to Jimmy Witt, it was our starting point guard who often, yeah, GP Grimacki, I'm the head women's basketball coach at Amherst College. Okay. Um, national national champion. He's just a nice. Yes. Yeah, hey, hey, well, hey, Jonah, I already, you know I already gave him a good promo, all right? Relax. Yeah. So. <laughs> I had to make sure. GP, <laughs> yes. I, I spoke at the Leeds program there. Do they still have that? We do. Oh, yeah. I spoke at that when I was an assistant in Boston one year. Yes. Beautiful campus. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. And what's funny is that Jonah just came on the call here. Jonah's first job was working for me. Ah, look at that. <laughs> nice. Nope. Nice. So that's how I'm on the call, and I really appreciate him having me here. But uh, I want to – first thing that you said I'm, I'm working on, I want to touch first thing, one thing, Mike, you said early that I really like. And I'm always looking for new ins and outs. You talked about tricking your players when you were doing the, you know, the offensive skill development and throwing the defense in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at Amherst, it's not easy to trick people, but if you're tricking them in the NBA, I'm sure you can trick them at Amherst. <laughs> and before I get to the thing I'm kind of working on, do you have anything else that you, you kind of trick your team, but, you know, you also said, you, you know, they really want you to be honest with them too. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. There's some guys you can, but in the NBA level, that's not going to last very long. And what I mean by just tricking is like, if I say, okay, Rondo, we're going to work on closeouts for five minutes before you do anything, he's going to tell me to go take a, a long walk off a short pier. You know? But if I say, all right, Rondo, you know what, let's work on your, your uh, pick and roll jumper. But what I want to, want to incorporate is let's work on you getting over this flare screen. 
So after you come off this pick and roll jumper, hey, space back up to the top and then have a coach ready. All right, this is uh, uh, Kyle Korver. All right, you're on that matchup. You got to get to his body and fight over the top. All right, now after you fight over the top, let's work on, you know, you – cutting out of the corner and helping off you so you can work on your catch and go attack. So you got three things that you just did. And at least if you got one thing defensively, it's better than nothing. That's how I look at it. Gotcha. No. The, thing, the thing I'm, you know, I'm going to struggle with for a while and it's probably going to take me into the season to figure it out is we had a great point guard who, you know, started three years for us and she just graduated. And so what I have for a point guard is, a real athletic kid that's not real a point guard, a great shooter that can't play defense, and an incoming first year that I think is solid, but you don't know until she arrives on campus. So my biggest thing is, you know, how do I play this great shooter that's a pretty solid point guard but literally can't play a lick of defense? And our, our, our thing is about being athletic. We've always had better defenses than teams. How do you hide someone, you know, you can play zone, like you guys yeah. just discussed, but how do you hide someone that you know is just a step slower or, you know, they're just they're going to try, but they're just not going to get there? Yeah, well, I would say this. Let, just try to point out a matchup, right? Can they guard the weakest player? Now, I, I just want you to think about this, GP, and you probably already have. If you're – um, player guards the opponent's weakest player and they try to uh, uh, expose your weak defender by giving that player the ball is that better for you that now their worst offensive player is trying to beat you versus their best so that's something I know it sounds so simple but something to think about and then if that is happening and then that's the case then you got to start thinking about some other things well, maybe we'll just double team. Now, that person may be, you know, beating them off the dribble, but is that person a good um, passer, right? If they see a double team, because we're putting them on the, we're putting that, that player on the weakest offensive player. Are they able to dribble, pass, and shoot? Um, that's something you can think about. Like this playoff series that, um, that we're, we're working on when it comes, comes to a lot of that stuff. Cool. Luke, anything, uh, anything your staff's done that you've really liked that you've taken a lot out of and, like, they're presenting something to you? Anything, you know, anything, to be honest, like, one thing I, I like, I'm always, like, we're at two months in, and I'll be honest, I've run out of ideas at this point. So, I'm actually, you know, is there anything your staff's done that you like? Um, like, honestly, like, this year, especially, like, uh, I mean, offensive and defensively, we're like it was really simple, and we really had like what we knew what we were trying to get to. And I, mean, I think like there's times where you sort of have natural instincts to trying to like wanting to make it more than what it just was. But like it was amazing offensively. Like we were just like we're playing with pace, and we have our couple actions. Yeah. And so then like outside of that, there's oh, like back you scout them. They were on pistol. Yeah. Play. <laughs> that's it yeah no it's like literally yeah it's like amazing how simple it was but like just uh, like we're doing those things and then we're if like none of that is like we're just like running into ball screens and doing it over and over and it's almost like trying to either get into that transition or getting to like if a ball screen doesn't work then you just create another ball screen and it's like a whole other offensive possession in a way so it's like I don't know, if you like kind of like analytically say it's like you're scoring like a point per possession on it well it's like well, if it didn't work, we're just going to run it back and then we have, like, a new chance. And it's almost, like, the exact same thing. And we I, we just played at this, like, so much that, uh, like, as much as you want to, like, kind of have, like, a lot more structure and stuff like that, we kind of got, like, really set in that, like, where like where your kind of shots are coming from. Like, like, it made the game really simple, I think, which is – I honestly, like, when it comes to even, like, what you're talking about with the Princeton, it's, like, like as, as like as long as you guys like know what you're doing, I feel like, and you really just like have, like like this is what it is. Like, and, and there's gonna be like a whole branch and web of things off of that. But it's like, if you just know that, like that puts you so far ahead. I feel like in most places, like it gets you like to like the 80th percentile right away of just like 
having that identity and like eliminating all that kind of confusion. Um, and so I, I we had that kind of same thing defensively. It was like, we're basically covering the same thing like over and over and over again. And it was different than what everyone else was facing. And like, it was amazing too, just how that threw like other teams off so much. Where it's like thinking they can make this play that they've made a thousand times, but because it's just different, like they screw it up. And like, we just drill basically like literally like two aspects of it was all you really needed. And you just had to do it better and better and better. And like, that can take you to a pretty high level before you're even having to get to like wrinkles off of stuff. And like, yeah, cause like, the Prince thing is exactly like, it's like, as long as you guys like know what you're doing and like they can start getting better at it, like mm -hmm. it's better to do that and like stick with it than you start like trying to change it and you get like 30% of the. Last time I was there, Ryan was for the Jim Dutcher basketball camp. At Carlton? Yeah. <laughs> guy, guy has some, guy has some pretty good Jim Dutcher camp stories um, from, from West Gymnasium. <laughs> hey let's uh let's go around and just maybe one or two person people from each group just share maybe one of the other ideas that you liked and it'll just kind of help stimulate some some other ideas for all of us I, i'm not doing the talk and i talked the whole time so it's up to you guys. <laughs> i'm gonna meet, i'm gonna mute you longo yeah i'm muting myself let me do that <laughs> Yeah, I can start in my group. Um, hey, can we also introduce ourselves? Just, I think some of us know each other, but. Sure. Uh, GP Grimacki, I'm the head women's basketball coach at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Um, you know, I, I graduated a really exciting, awesome point guard and I uh, need to find a replacement for next year. And my real choices are a first year coming in or an outstanding shooter that can't play a lick of defense. So I got great input from my group. Um, and Mike talked about how he would put, you know, that player on the weakest player and hopefully they'll give them the ball and hopefully it works out um, you know, rather than just playing zone and trying to hide her that way. And I thought it was really a good, interesting concept. And if that isn't working, you could start double teaming and help her any aspect. And then, you know, Mike had more than one answer, which is great. It wasn't just one, one answer. The other thing he said, if this person's that good of a shooter, you know, you can win a lot of games just by outscoring people, and that's something we might have to do that we don't do very often, to be honest with you. Thanks, GP. Let's just popcorn style it. Someone, someone from another group. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Ted Hotelling, head coach at the University of New Haven. So we spent the uh, majority of our time talking about, uh, you know, downing or ice coverage, just some of the uh, – pitfalls of it, especially in your, if in a small college level, you know, I know Trey mentioned in our league, we're, we're playing five, you know, five out a lot like the NBA. And if you do ice, what are some of the challenges with, uh, you know, we have a seven foot one kid coming in. So we're going to change quite a bit with our ball screen coverage and not extend as much, but uh, just trying to attack some of the challenges that will pose with five out five shooters, five men that are on the, on the perimeter. We want to hear from people we haven't heard from yet. Speak up. So my group, um, Luke was sharing a little bit from a player's perspective about the kind of philosophy changes um, in Chicago and just the simplicity of how they're playing on both ends. And um, so he's kind of sharing the kind of his perspective on, on the value of that and, and all that. I think for our coaches, for like us as coaches, it's, it's valuable to remember that because we're in this this time, this season where we're gathering all sorts of information, <laughs> and the temptation is going to be like to want to do all of it when you get to the fall and being able to like decipher and, and think through, okay, what fits, what what fits what we're currently doing, what do we believe in? Like we talked about last week, um, it's it's also important to look at the player's perspective a little bit as well too, and just say, hey. We can't overwhelm. We got to keep some of the simplicity, so they're not thinking a lot. They're they're able to make the reads and react how how we want them to to play. So that was helpful. A little reminder to to think about as we process different stuff. Which groups haven't we heard from yet? We haven't heard from ours. Uh, I'm Blaine Miller. I'm the video coordinator with the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, Anthony 
mentioned his project, uh, studying zone defenses. So uh, uh, kind of um, piggybacking off the, the comment earlier about jumping into his own uh, end of shot clock situation or a personnel situation. So we, we kind of went through uh, and our, basically our entire conversation devolved into different utilizations of zone uh, schemes um, and, and situation. And then we had, we had the man behind the computer to, to give us a little insight on, on efficiencies with it. Um, but it, it was pretty interesting just to, to kind of talk, um, especially at the NBA level for a while, it really hasn't been too prevalent, but we're seeing a lot more, um, whether it's uh, a specific team or again, situations um, and just kind of how that impacts teams offenses and um, their response to it uh, based on what they're seeing, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out how they're going to attack it. Um, and Seth can speak. Uh, what was the, what was the statistic? It was, it's worth a, it's worth a nickel. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a stat that I've probably quoted the last couple of weeks is every extra point you, you, every extra uh, second of shot clock, you make a team burn before they get into something is worth a point of offensive uh, rating. So if you make a team, you sub, you, jump them with the zone and they're not expecting it and they burn five seconds uh, trying to, to figure out what you're in before they start running something. That's, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a nickel. That's, that's five points of offensive rating. You've cost them on, on, on that possession. And that's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not everything, but it's still, it's free money. You just picked up off the ground. I would definitely agree with that. Um, we, we played a, quite a bit of zone, you know, situationally and I in our small group, we talked about it. We won about four games playing zone, I, I believe, this year. We beat Oklahoma City early in the year. It was the second game. They weren't prepared for it. Um, we beat uh, Philly. They had no answer for it either. And um, we beat the Knicks twice. Um, and we, we played – and I, listen, we didn't play the whole game of zone, but we played a significant amount. And I, I don't know. If you go to Synergy, I think Miami ranked number one. I think uh, uh, Brooklyn was number two, and I think we might have been three. And, and we really had a stretch where we might have been number one and, and, and just tail back. Look, I, I think it's great. Um, I told our, our group, because we brought up zone as well, I look at it like going to the blackjack table. And, and if you hit, you, you play it again. If you hit, you play it again. And you hit, you play it again. You play it again. You play it again. But then if you start giving up two or three threes in a row, then that's kind of where, like, because I think, and you guys know this, uh, Blaine and Jonah and, and, and Clay, you've been in the NBA. Like, these guys are, are smart. Like, they'll figure it out. And, and the one shot you don't want to give up is a corner three. And I always feel like in the zone, that was the one shot that was wound up giving up. So I know we had this argument. We're talking, well, you're giving up threes anyway. Well, yeah, but now if we give up a three in the man, we know whose fault it was. In the zone, it's like, well, I thought I had to go here and then I had to go there. And then, you know, it, it, it creates that thing. And then you're in a huddle and they're like, yo, what, what are we doing? You know, and, and that's where I know it sounds easier said than done. And it's a great idea. Like, yeah, you can write about it and throw it out there and, and, and save the world. But it's not as easy as you think, you know. So that's just my, my little two cents. But I do, think, I do think it can disrupt the game. I'm not, I will not disagree with that at all. But like I said, I think it's just the feel. You got to know when to get in and know when to get out. Yeah. So I think like when when to walk away from the table. Like exactly. The the table I like. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you can't throw all off speed. Yeah. But um, I do think uh, to your point, like the situation stuff, like ATOs. That, that was what one of the situations I brought up. Um, and to use the name you used earlier, like Taylor Jenkins, like he would try to get Bud to do it all the time. <laughs> Like, I mean, they, you know, you go into a timeout, you're looking at your personnel, you're looking at their personnel, drawing up a play, you know, trying to, whether it's getting, getting a guy that, that needs to get a look a shot or, you know, a guy that's, that's hot trying to go back to him or you like a specific matchup, you pick that play, you draw it up, talk it through, hey, this, 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 you know, they're going to cover it this way. You walk out there and the other team's in a zone and it's like, like, what do we spend all that time for? The one, the one zone I do like, it is uh is the Brad Stevens one at the end of the game? Yeah, that yeah. And and just because we're doing the study of watching um this Boston Washington series like for our team, and and being in Cleveland, we played the winner. So like Ty and I would talk, and and our big thing was look if if they score, we're not calling timeout because number one, two things are going to happen. They're going to get into that zone, 
And one thing we did get, we did kind of burn it. And, and they've been getting burned a little bit more on it than, than he hadn't in the past. Um, and two, they would take Isaiah off the floor. So they were able to put a stronger defender in. So we were like, yo. And we told our guys going into the playoffs, like, we have our meeting. Look, if it's a close game, we may not call, probably not going to call a timeout because of these two reasons. And then when you go to them with that, they were cool. They understood. In that series, we really didn't have a close game. I think we had, like, one close game, and then we blew them out the rest of them. You know, it was it was crazy. Yeah, that's one way to avoid it. Just just blow them out. And then yeah. you don't worry about EOGs. <laughs> but we got fortunate. Like Isaiah got hurt. They were banged up. Kyrie was going nuts. LeBron was going nuts. Like, look, I'd love to say I had, we had this magic formula. We just had some really good <laughs> players that were playing well. Just like GP was saying, like, look, we were shooting threes at an extraordinary rate. Like, like I mean, J.R. Smith, and you got Channing Frye, and then we had Kyle Korver. I mean, man, and then if Bron has that. It's over, man. It's over. You know, we need Luke Carnett. That would have been the icing on the cake. <laughs> I can uh, I can share from our group. Um, I had posed the question. One of our uh, kind of off season evaluations is we essentially we were we were last in our league in uh, three point field goal attempts. Our our percentage was middle of the pack, fine, but our attempts was was bottom of the league and. Um, so I had gone through and looked at our, you know, essentially our, all the attempts we give up and have different various categories as to why, but within our group, uh, Clay was on in our group and his team at, at Arkansas, they actually led the country in three point field goal uh, defense this past year. And so I was just picking his brain. We were just exchanging different ideas as far as what, you know, why, you know, from his standpoint and he, was able to share and elaborate a little bit from a technique standpoint. He had talked a few weeks ago about some of the things they do from a game prep, uh, from a scouting standpoint. Uh, but even technically, he talked about, you know, how different is the technique that they teach there at Arkansas versus what they taught, you know, what's been taught uh, in the NBA from a rules, rules change uh, from that standpoint. Um, and then we just talked about some of the various differences, you know, his personnel, like, I, you know, is a bunch of quick guys, ours not as much. Um, his was, uh, they had, you know, a more experienced team than we had from that standpoint too, but, uh, there was just a lot of kind of give and take from that standpoint. Um, you know, and, and kind of looking at that one of, it was very beneficial for me as that's one of our uh, projects this off season. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I will say too, just on experience, like the three is important, but I, I don't think, I think a lot of people want to say that, but I also think the quality of the shot is, is what really matters. Like, I know one thing that drives me nuts, and we have an elite shooter in, in Bertans, is, is sometimes if a guy comes down and takes a bad shot, it, 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 guys don't want to get back on defense, you know, and then, it, and then one affects the other. Like, being a defensive coordinator, I, I really, if, if I ever do get an opportunity to be a head coach, I'm really going to preach, um, like, dry run offense, uh, executing offense, and taking a great shot so you can have floor balance. Uh, because I think that's the one thing. If you look at Steve Clifford, and 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 I love him. He gave me my opportunity. Their teams in Charlotte and their teams in Orlando are always at the top, low turnover, and the best in transition. So they're never beating. You know, they're never really beating themselves. And I think that's critical. You know, now if you're really talented, like we were in Cleveland, you can get away with some non-run backs in transition, right? But, but if you're trying to be successful and you're, you're like a, you know, mid to average, you know, team in your league, those are the things that you can't give up or easy baskets. I, I'm just a big believer in that, you know. Yeah, I agree, Mike, that the, the uh, in the first, as simple as it sounds, the first line of good defense is good offense. Like if you, if you put yourself in harm's way, and, and one of the things I, I, one of the sayings I took from Steve, one of his sayings, I use it all the time, and nobody even knows what the hell I'm talking about, but he talked about, you know, start right, end right, start wrong, end wrong. And, like, if you, if you have a shit offensive possession, you have just started your defensive possession wrong. And, that, and your chances of catching up uh, with the players at that level is next to nothing. Let me tell you something. That's an abbreviated version because Van Gundy used to say, if it starts fucked up, it's going to end fucked up. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I don't know who's all on the call, so I'm trying to behave. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're recording this, right? Oh, no. <laughs>
Well, I remember no. Jeff, Jeff Van Gundy used to say that all the time, and it's so true, man. You start with a bobble, then it's a turnover. Next thing you know, it's a dunk. And then it's, yeah, it starts fucked up and ends fucked up. Hey, this was really good. I don't know if we have one or two last questions or, or comments. Joel, you want to get in there? Yeah, I got one oh. question. I was just kind of curious on what the analytics are. I'm a high school co coach in Portland, Oregon. Um, and one thing we messed with a little bit last year, I was the JV coach and varsity assistant, was um, to get back to like, how do we stop their best player? We notice at least in Oregon, almost all the possessions start just on the right-hand side. So we would, especially on free throws and like late in games, end of quarters, we would always force, make them start. We just call them, make them start it, start it wrong. Kind of how you guys were just saying starts fucked up, ends fucked up. Like we would, that was just one little thing we would try because most of the time, especially at the end of quarters, they were trying, their point guard was trying to advance the ball and get to their best player. So we'd face guard. Then after that, we would um, – uh, just play normal defense. But what are the analytics as far as the NBA college level to if they start on the same side of the floor every time? Or does that not play any effect into what you guys do because everybody's so talented? No, I mean, I think that's definitely – like we have all these charts with, with hot spots and, you know, this guy like Avery Bradley, like that right elbow area – excuse me, that left elbow area is a hot spot for him, you know, because he's able to come off – to his right hand, and I'm just using him as an example. And it might not be the case now, because he's he's getting older. And not that he's old, but like when he first started, or three years ago, when and that's the footage I showed you. Like that's his hot spot. So you want to prevent him from doing that. And that's where I was making the point about Boston being so difficult to defend because you have Al Horford who can trigger plays. And you got Avery Bradley in the left corner, and then you got Isaiah Thomas in the right corner coming off to his left hand. It's the same thing with Golden State pre-injury. You have Draymond triggering the plays. You got Curry coming off one side. You got Clay coming off the other. Like you got to pick your poison. Like like so, in those high-level situations, it might not matter. But versus the rest of the league, yeah, hell yeah. If, if, if we want them to not catch the ball there or make him dribble this way. I think it absolutely is pertinent and, and will be helpful. Seth, you got anything to add? Uh, I mean, I mean, again, especially if uh, like, do, do they play in, in, in Oregon? Do they play with a shot clock? We uh, no, we're still playing. Okay. Uh, you can end the game two to zero. Okay. No, I mean, but even so you, I mean, you, you make the, the them do something else, you know, they want to do one thing. Don't let them. And then yeah. like, like, um, I, you know, it, it, it it, it's it's a similar thing that that um, I'll say to in general. Um, I think it used to be more true that if you got like a a ball reversal or two it would be better for your offense. I think that since kind of the that has declined over the last couple of years as the style of defense has changed a little bit. You know, it used to be kind of with the kind of the the blitzing trapping defense that was you know the, the Tib style. Like you get it off one side, get it to the other side of the floor. You're you know you're playing three on two. Um, as kind of the softer style of coverage has for everyone but Luke has has started to be to be played, um, uh, uh, I think it, that that's probably less true than it was. But I still think that that like I think that's a really smart like yeah they they want to do this make them do something else because you you make them do one more thing that's one more thing they could screw up and then you know they they fumble it they get a turnover the the guy gets the ball at you know twenty eight feet instead of twenty two feet. Like, you know, it, it, you, you've helped yourself a little bit just by making them do something else. Yeah. You know, another line that I got from Van Gundy, and I use it every time we do walkthrough, is like one step makes a difference. So, like, just like with Al Horford, when he's dribbling the ball down, if we make him dribble one step higher and not lower, it makes a big difference. It disrupts the flow and rhythm of their offense. And getting back to Seth's point, like, that's my thing. Let's people get out of their comfort zone. If they're going to play, just like GP was talking about, he wants to hide his best player. I just watched this series. Boston was putting Isaiah Thomas on Otto Porter and Kelly Oubre and, like, not avoiding him on Brad and John. Now, he did have to guard them uh, quite a bit, but they were able to steal some possessions with them on it. And that's what you're going to have to find. And, like, studying rotations, like, going back to – to my presentation tonight, like a big thing to me is lineups. Like 
Like what lineups are good for us? Like, and, and, and you have to also look at it. Like, did we like the one thing that's a little, gets a little convoluted, like in the NBA, at least we, we want, we're in ninth place. We had a really good year, I think for our standards, but when we played some teams, we weren't at full strength. And I've been on the other side of the spectrum. You know, when a team comes in to play us and there's no Bradley Beal and no Davis Bertans, like they, they just, it's human nature. They're just going to lay down. Like Milwaukee, we played you guys this year. Milwaukee's the best team in the NBA. Look, can I go around pumping my chest that we took them to overtime? Look, they did not respect us at all. And, and I'm not, and I'm being totally honest. Like, but that doesn't mean our guys still don't play hard and that they don't compete and they try. But you have those situations where it happens. It's happened historically all over the NBA. Every year, every team does it. I think if you have 82 games, if you have six or less, like, no show up nights, that's a win for you. That's a win for you. You know. I think Chuck Daly called them schedule losses, Mike, is what he called them. No doubt. Schedule losses. Like, like you have little to no chance to win certain games. But I'm talking about, Clay, I I get you on that when you're coming back. But I'm talking about when guys know – their best player is not playing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a human nature letdown. Like, we had a situation, and I'm not naming names because we're recording this, but I go over walkthrough, and I mentioned Spencer Dinwiddie, and this was kind of, you know, he had bounced around, right? Spencer was in Detroit first, then Chicago, and then he's kind of found his way in Brooklyn, and he was just starting to play. And it's like, you know, yeah, Spencer Dinwiddie. Well, Spencer did when he hit a huge three, two minutes to go in the fourth quarter in your face. That's who Spencer did when he is. And those things happen. You know, you try to prevent yeah, them, oh yeah. but, but they, at our level, now your level is different. Like college, the one thing I get fascinated with, and we got a bunch of small college people on here. Um, like I was talking about how many hard games do like you guys play, right? So Illinois, all right, you're on here. How many hard games do you have to play? Now, you're not at the top yet. You guys are you're trending up. But you probably have a lot more hard games than, let's say, Michigan State. Yeah, no, no doubt. I disagree. No doubt. I think 13 of our 20 league games were like seven points or less. Yeah. Like, and I'm talking about the Dukes and the Kentuckys. Now, I know they schedule well, so their non-conference yeah. is, is challenging. Um, but, like – like in the NBA, if you're not ready to play, I don't care who you are, you 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 will get beat. You know, you will get beat. You have to come ready to play. I was just gonna add one more one comment to kind of the great player discussion and like defensive strategies and you know all the things that have been said. I think there's so many good good things um, we had. So we had the Division Three Player of the Year in our league. So like relativity, right? Like the D three National Player of the Year could like would probably be a walk-on like at Arkansas for clay. Okay. But like in our league, he's the equivalent of, you know, maybe not LeBron, but like pretty close. Right. And so just in all the strategies and and whatnot, but, um, and again, you're still in possession. So whether you're blitzing the first possession, just trying to throw them off balance. Right. One thing that we would do occasionally, you know, we would start with a different matchup. So we'd match up, we'd go small on them. First possession, we, we'd put a guard on them. Okay. And we know, okay, next possession, like they're going to read that first possession. Next possession, we know that they're going to put them in the block. They're going to ISO post up, whatever. We'd switch that matchup back and put a bigger on them. And just, just again, some of those different strategies where you're stealing a possession or two possessions were over the course of the game, where you're, you're hoping that at the end of 65, seven possessions, it's going to come out, you know, come out on, uh, on your side ahead. Uh, I know I, I'm all for that. Like I know one thing, when you're guarding great players, whether it's LeBron, Giannis, you know, James Harden, you better anticipate multiple, multiple guys guarding them, you know, because it's going to be foul trouble. That's going to happen. Those guys, that's the beauty of the great players. They draw fouls, whether they get handed to them or not, you know, you're going to have to put multiple guys on them. Like, like that, that might even be a better idea. That's something to think about, but I still don't know if I'd have the guts to do it. I'll be honest. Like I, I'm still going to put my best guy on them, you know, but, but, but be ready to have your plan B and C, you know, uh, that's, definitely, that's definitely the case. 
Hey, to that to that point, um, we guarded Peyton Pritchard from Oregon, who's the best player in our league. Um, I'm at Stanford, and you know, instead of changing up end of game and blitzing and trying to get out of his hands, we literally just try to wear him down with three different guys in, in the second yeah. half. And um, he ended up he went six for twenty one in that game. It was probably uh, I think it was really worthwhile to give him different looks and different you know, different, especially different levels of length, right? Like he's a six, one guard who's really good. He averaged 23 a game. Um, but we had a guy with a six eleven wingspan guarding him. Then we had a six, one guard with not much length. And then we had a six, four kind of bulldog guard do it as well. And I think it really messed with him. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like if you have multiple guys, with, that's why size is so important in our league. Like if you have guys that are, are tall, long, and physical, especially the three, four spot is trending to be the real power spot in our league. You know, obviously the point guards are great, but, but I really believe the killers in our league are the three fours. Like, like those are the guys that, that can just create double teams and, and just do it all. Um, it's funny because like when I first came into the league, it was more like, you know, the fours, you know, were pretty good. Like, like you know, you had Kevin Garnett, you had Tim Duncan, and then now it's kind of evolved to the, the Giannis's, LeBron's, Kevin Durant's, and those guys of the world, you know. Um, so that's where it's kind of changed a little bit. Um, but I do think multiple guys is, is critical. Like, to me, that's why, like, if it was up to me, I would switch, you know, um, not off the ball, but on the ball one through four if you had that, that ability. I think that would be your best defense. Um, but sometimes you don't have a four man that's, you know, good enough to, to stay with a point guard or a two man or whoever's running the pick and roll, or you may not have a one man who can keep a four man off the box, off the block or, or stop them in the post. So, and then once again, it goes back to always, right? Know your team, what you're good at and, and what you're going to be successful and where your, where your success is coming from, excuse me. Hey, this was, this was really good tonight. Longo. Thanks a lot for, for joining us and sharing. And uh, I'll send a link in the next day or two um, of, of this recording. Um, so let me know if anyone has any questions before we part tonight. Hey, Jonah, I've yeah. got a, I have a public service announcement again. Yep. I have, for you guys at the Division two or lower Division one levels, I have a 6'3 combo guard from Spain and a 6'7 shooter from Australia. I can almost immediately get you involved with. I'm not going to bullshit you. It will help our program. Um, we just don't feel like they're quite our level, but I can get you immediately involved if I can get those kids a scholarship. And I'm going to have this shit every week we talk. <laughs> hey, C3 is about getting jobs, about getting players. There's a lot that goes down right now in the after. So, oh. so for those of you guys who just have, like, you're done with scholarships, we don't operate like that at Arkansas. We're, like, roster management is, is our thing. <laughs> so we got players. We got, I, I'm just telling you, I can help you. That's great. I can't guarantee them, but I can, I can help you get involved. Reach out to Clay individually so we don't record it. Keep <laughs> okay. hey, hey, thanks so much that, for having that me. Out, I really appreciate it. <laughs> hey, thanks, everyone. All right, Stay Jonah. safe out there. Thanks, Coach. Yeah, thank you. Be good. Thank you.